welcome to the Dojo Talk Podcast. Please remove them shoes before entry. Say Master is here and you still have not taken off your shoes. Every day to define man's mission yeah. Look into the sky for divine transmission yeah. Deaf man's vision makes the blind man listen yeah. Eyes on the prize, this is blind ambition Thank you Welcome to another edition of the Dojo Talk Podcast I am your host, Serial Sensei We are on episode number 151 As always, you can give this podcast a listen on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, YouTube Send questions to Dojo Talk Podcast at yahoo.com. Hit us up on social media at the Dojo Talk Podcast Facebook page, as well as the Instagram page. And you can follow follow me on Twitter and Twitch at Serial Sensei. <clears throat> and of course, as always, I'm joined with my co host, Antaku. What's going on, man? Uh, not much. Uh, I know I said I'd have something for this week. It's not, it's not, it's not spicy, but. You know, to start off the show, because I feel I feel like that's the part that's good. I, I've gotten lazy on, because we used to start the show with like all these r- great conversations about ringtone rapper re- uh, reunion <laughs> tours, and I, I I guess competitive masturbation. <laughs> oh, that was a thing. That was a thing we talked about, and yet you let us talk about. Um, but, uh, it's been chill. Um. So, so have I asked you about your takes on the Joker movie um, that is coming out, that is not currently out? I feel like we might have talked about it. I don't know if we talked about it on air, though. Uh, like, maybe not. Um, <laughs> You know what's crazy that you brought that up? <laughs> Ever since you said, um, I don't remember if this was on, on air or off air, <laughs> but you mentioned that this is going to be the perfect movie for a movie shooting to happen. Yeah. And I've really been thinking about that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm honestly like, because I, I I do want to go see it. I re- I actually do really want to go see this. I think is. I, I think it's gonna be good. Uh, well, I'm I'm cautiously optimistic that'll be good. And then when I really thought about what you said, I was like, you know what? He's he might have said that in jokingly, but he, he, oh no, one hundred percent serious. <laughs> I was like, oh man, that's, I think when I really sit and think about it, uh, maybe I could wait a week or two. <laughs> maybe, maybe not so much opening week. I don't know what kind of crowd, you know, that might bring out. But, but I, normally when I do go see movies, um, I normally catch matinees. And the theater that I go to, I don't go to the cool kids theater. Uh, I go to the one that nobody goes to because nobody goes there, so I can. I, I never have to fight to find a seat. Normally, it's a pretty empty theater. Uh, I think the only two times I've seen my movie theater like jam packed was uh, Infinity. No, not Infinity Wars. Uh, Endgame. It was packed, and probably Star Wars. I want to say. And then when the Dragon Ball Z movie came out, so all right, so it was like three times. So like three times out of like a billion has my theater been packed. Right. I don't think Joker is gonna. I don't know. We might have a Joker crowd out here. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. But, like my my whole thing is like. So. What, what was it? The Dark Knight. Hmm. It wasn't a very subtle movie in terms of like, oh, the the Joker was wrong about his, his perceptions of what humanity is, and that when the chips are down, people will turn against you. Like that was the whole point of the movie. Right. Right. I don't know. I don't know if I trust the guy from the Hangover movies to 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 not create something that is like. I don't want a Joker anti-hero because he's not an anti-hero. That and I don't want a Joker that. <laughs> this better not be one of those stories where it's like, oh, I became the Joker because I got bullied and people called me names when I was little. But apparently it's because he was a bad stand-up comedian and no one laughed at his jokes and he got beat up on the job. That's all I got from the trailer. I remember... I'm trying to remember what they did in The Killing Joke. 
Well, his, yeah. in the Killing Joke, he was a bad stand-up comedian who got like who fell in with the mob. Yeah. And I think they like killed his wife, and like Batman beat him up and threw him into like a vat of acid that bleached his skin and gave him green hair. Which doesn't. Which even in the Killing Joke, they're like, uh, he he wait he blatantly states like he doesn't remember his own backstory. Like it, it, he if he's every time he tells a story, it's a little different. Right. So even that, it's just, you take that with a grain of salt. But like, my point being, dude, I I don't need a character movie about the Joker. Like, th- there is a whole bunch of other, and obviously none of them are as like lucrative as making like a Joker film. But like, we live in a society. Joker is probably the lamest angle to take on a movie. <laughs> Like, yeah. give me, give me the Doctor Free, like the Mister Freeze, like yeah. fucking capitalism is killing my wife movie. G- give me like, um, I don't know, like Solomon Grundy would be an interesting movie. That's an interesting, uh, interesting concept. But like, I- I'm good. Like, maybe it's just because I I've, I've read the comics and like I've been, I've been inundated with like the Joker. And we have, like, basically, like, three or four video games where he's basically the star of. I I don't need more. I think I... I don't mind it. I'm almost expecting this movie to be one of those movies where, like, I feel like the acting is going to be excellent. Like, I'm going to like the movie, but when I really sit with it and, like, look over the plot, I'm going to be like, uh, this was... Yeah. <laughs> like... <laughs> Like, the motivations are probably going to be really just kind of, like, lackluster. But, like, everything else will be good. But I'll look at, like, what motivated the movie, and I'll be like, ah, this is kind of lazy. Because I think Joaquin Phoenix is going to... I think he's going to do a good job as a Joker. Uh, I think he's going to do a great fantastic. job. Fantastic. He's a fantastic actor. Like, yeah. I, I, it's... I don't know. The, the, mo- the, the movie itself from just... I think if you detach all of the social and everything else around it, it'll be a great movie. But once you look at it, like, in context and, you know, you kind of put that reality spin on it, I guess, it'll be like, eh, you guys probably shouldn't know. This might not be it. <laughs> this might not be it. I'm going to go see it, though. I'm, I'm going to... I haven't been to the movies in a while, actually. I've been on, been on a, a hiatus. I haven't been to the movies since Brightburn came out, I think. That was back in like June, June, mm-hmm. July. So it's been it's been a little bit for me. So Joker might bring me back out. I think the last movie I saw was Endgame. I thought it was Which I, yeah. yeah, like I feel bad. Like I've, there's been movies I've wanted to see. I've just been too lazy to get up and actually go to the theater. Yeah, I've yeah I've been kind of burnt out. So I just haven't really I haven't felt like going. But you know, I'll make that a thing. Then whenever either one of us sees Joker. We'll start off the episode. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll we'll let we'll let out how we feel. We'll see how that goes. But um, yeah. So that was our intro spiel. Uh, I don't really have much interesting. I did some cool things the other day, but I don't think anybody really cares. I went to Delaware. Delaware was cool. You got tolls are crazy though. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. Jesus Christ. And you're like right there too. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> I drive thirty minutes. Well, I mean, to get where I was going, I went to the Christiana Mall. Um, well, that's where we went to Yeah. Uh, so it only took me about, I don't even think, maybe under an hour. It was about, probably about under an hour to get up there. Um, but, like, to get to Delaware for me is only about a 35, to, like, cross state lines, 30, 35-minute drive. Why am I paying $8 in tolls? Like, I, I, live, I live right here. Like, <laughs> I Delaware's got to fucking pay for that highway somehow, yeah. Uh, yeah, they got uh, like so. Uh, so after Jersey, like I'm not used to driving on any other highways. Like the the only time I drove in a highway in like PA, I got a ticket for speeding, uh, like a really bad ticket. I was going 30 miles over the speed limit. Mm. I think we talked about that. But um, like right, what what is the deal with like once we leave, once I go south of Jersey, just just like. 20 lane highways because <laughs> like I, you know I, I i use the turnpike in the in the 
uh, the parkway up here when I want to get around, and it's like it's never goes more than like three or four lanes. And I, I guess you know it's, they split it up. You know they have like one for trucks and buses and stuff, and one for cars. But like I go to Delaware, a state that has a smaller population than the county I live in, in here in Jersey, and there's like fifty lanes, and they're always full of cars. Can, can you and in Christian at all? Like that place is packed every time I pass it. Yeah, I got lucky. I found a I found a really good parking spot when I got there. I got I got lucky. The mall wasn't too crowded though. It wasn't it wasn't too crowded. I went around Saturday, probably around uh I don't know. I got there at like one. Yeah. One one two o'clock. But it was it was a cool it was a cool time. It was a cool time. So shout out to Delaware, but y'all toes uh out of control. Out of control. But the mall was cool. So that was cool. But uh you know what somehow I was gonna try to segue Delaware into the listeners, but uh you guys aren't in the top five. Um <laughs> I think you guys are even on the list. But, you know, maybe there's a listener out there. Maybe possibly. But as far as listeners, top cities for the week. Number one, San Francisco, California. Number two, Oklahoma, Florida. Uh, number three, Atlanta, Georgia. Number four, Los Angeles, California. And number five, Amon, Jordan. If I'm saying that right. So, shout out to you guys, Amon, Jordan. But I uh, appreciate all the listeners, wherever you are. Share, repost, retweet, tag a friend, tell them they need to listen. Um, all that good stuff. So, as far as today's episode, um, I feel like there are some random happenings we could talk, not really go in depth about, but just recently mentioned, like, Karate Combat, uh, had a random card yesterday, they claimed it started at, like, 8, didn't start till 8.50. No, 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 they claimed it would start at 7. Oh. <laughs> seven. <laughs> they, they pushed the, they pushed the start time back every 10 minutes. Until, until about 8.50, and then it finally started. But, yeah, if, you, if you're interested in karate combat, that is a thing again. The full card is on their YouTube page. Uh, there was some boxing uh, this weekend also. Don't remember a lot of names, but a couple of people got flatlined. But we'll mostly be pretty much strictly talking uh, UFC Mexico City. But before we get to that, as always, got to start with the fight announcements and news for the week. Um... Not really a ton of news, but I got a pretty actually decent amount of fight announcements to go through. So I will just run this from the top. Um, probably one of the biggest fights that got announced. Uh, actually, I think like literally this got announced yesterday. Um, UFC 245. Uh, we were we had talked about after Max Holloway's last fight about uh, when we thought we would see him again. Well, we will get to see him at UFC 245. Uh, he will be defending his featherweight title against against Alexander Volkanovsky. And also on the same card, we will be treated to Robbie Lawler versus Santiago Ponzinibbio. So, that's a lot of violence in two fights. Um, I'm digging it. Um, how, do you, how do you think Volkanovsky's chances are against uh, against Holloway? Um, I'd like them better if he, if he was a bit lo- uh, like taller. Like, uh, I just see, like, I, I think Frankie had some success because of his, like, height, but Frankie's also a dude who likes to come in from the outside. Um, like, Volk, I, like, I just see Volk getting caught at the end of Max Holloway's range, cause, and Max is really, really good at keeping guys at the end of his range, if he wants them to be. Um, I, I think it'll be interesting, because I think we're going to see a little bit more of the Matador style we've seen from Max. Um... Like, I don't think he'll be the one pressuring Volk until either Volk breaks or slows down, which might not, not might not happen in the fight. Um, but yeah, I think I think Max takes it probably by decision, maybe a late stoppage, but probably by decision. Huh. Uh, I really like Volkanovski's chances, um, cause dude is just one of those guys that just kind of never. He's just always in your face. Dude is just like a tank. Ah, 
I don't know if I can pick him to win though. Like I think he can win. If he does win, I honestly wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised. I really like what I saw from him in the Mendez fight, but I think he'll make it really, really competitive. But I, yeah, I think I can see him probably dropping a really hard fought, probably five round decision. Um, but that's that's going to be an amazing fight. Um, I think I think one X factor um, before, before we hop off it um, is well, it's wrestling. Because we saw Dustin Poirier take Max down, but and Max not be able to do much of anything to get back up. But um, I, I don't think Max actually prepared for Poirier to take him down. I, 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 like, do you remember the last time before that fight Poirier shot on anybody? Right. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that, that yeah. that's something to pay attention to. Yeah. That that's gonna be an awesome fight though. As as Will Lawler and uh Ponzinibbio. I gotta be honest though, man. I think Ponzi's gonna get him out of there. Probably. Yeah. Uh the one um so our, uh he's Lawler's lost to like RDA and Kobe Covington his last couple times out, right? So my thought process is um those are two guys who can go to the wrestling, who like to fight in the clinch, who like to push people back. Um, Pons doesn't really do much of that. Like he'll fight behind the jab, but he's very much, um, I, I guess, a boxer puncher. Like he will just fight with you at range. Like he will fight at range, but it's not like an outfighter range. It's like a mid range between like in the pocket and on the outside. Um, and then that gives lower a chance. I, I, I don't like his chances over the court. Like, is this the main event? Of, um... What card was this announced for again? No, this is still on, uh, this one 245. Okay, sorry. Um, I thought it was, like, a fight night somewhere. Um, yeah, um, even in a 15-minute fight, like, I, I guess it just comes down to how active will Lawler be, because he's kind of, he kind of just shut down his, like, against RDA and... Kobe, and that was in large part because of what the other guys were doing, but at the same time, like, Lawler get, see, it, like, his body broke down in the RDA fight, um, and, like, it, it, it seems like it's getting harder and harder for him to pull the trigger, like, even against Covington, who is admittedly a way higher paced fighter, and probably just so much more difficult to just be, like, just to decide to stand, plant your feet, and throw something, like, he did not at any point have the urgency to be like, okay, I'm down four rounds. Let me just go out here and spam attacks until something happens or I lose. Yeah, we spent the whole fight just kind of waiting for a moment that just never really... <laughs> just kind of never really happened. Right, and I'm, I'm curious if if that if that has more to do with Covington's evolution as a striker or that Lawler is just slowing down. I mean, it could be a little bit of, of both. As much as I hate giving uh, Kobe props, like that kind of pressure just probably broke him a little bit. Like, right. Just, yeah. They're really, really just kind of overwhelming to deal with. I, I just feel like Lawler and Ponzi is it's gonna be one of those fights that's fun until it's over. Right. <laughs> and it's, it's probably gonna be over. Or I, I give it like round two. Was this? Like, oh, oh, sorry. Good. No, nah, so yeah, I think it'll be just be fun until. Eventually, uh, I think he's gonna crack Robbie. I, uh, I, I can see it. Yeah. Um, was this the last fight they announced for uh, UFC 245 this week? Uh, last one I saw. There could be more, but um, I feel I like know, from what I've seen, seen that card is pretty. Uh, yeah, no, that card's great so far. Yeah, um, yeah. I want to say, oh, there were two other things from that card. Um. So Dana White came out and said that this will be a three fight, uh, three title fight pay per view. Yeah, I think they're, tri- they're still trying to find the uh, the third one. The third one, yeah. Um, I'm guessing it's probably going to be Jones, right? Because Jones said he wanted to fight three times this year. So Hudo's gone until apparently March. So that's two titles off the table. Um, I, I don't know what's happened with Khabib and Tony. Um. So and who knows what's happening with Deep A, uh DC? Oh, might as well squeeze in Jones because that card's in December. You might as well squeeze in Jones before. But at the same time, I can't think of a person for Jones to fight because the UFC just booked every, all the 
light heavyweights against each other. So uh, unless they want to run back Anthony Smith, it, it, it's slim pickings. So we'll see, we'll see. But two, yeah, two, two forty-five is gonna be fire though. Oh, one. Oh, I got one bit of news from there. Um, oh. Remember Kellen Vieira? She alive? She's she's out there. She is out there, and she said the UFC. Uh, she just got cleared to start training again. Um, hey. And the she's came, and the, she went. Uh, she spoke to um, who was it? I don't think it was Buddy Elba. I think it was an MMA junkie. Um, but she spoke to some um, news organization, and they were. And she was like, "The UFC offered me a fight for uh, UFC 245." There we go. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So she spent. For those that know, um, Yara is a top five women's bantamweight, undefeated. I think she's ten to zero. Nova Uniao fighter. Um, she spent the last year and a half unable to train because she tore, I think she tore something in her legs. I don't know if it was like an ACL tear or not, but um, she's basically not been able to train. Um, and she probably would have had to retire because she was broke at the time. Um, the only reason she's been able to get surgery at all is because uh, Nova Uniao, uh boss man, Andre Pedernares, paid for it. So she has been unable to trade and because of her injuries I'm unable to actually work so that's what being a top five fighter at UFC gets you I guess yeah <laughs> but that is could you imagine like I'm trying to think a top five player in the NBA who would be close to like number five if you were like I'm just throwing a name out there if you're like Paul George and you could <laughs> like you couldn't afford to play your sport because you were too broke, like you got injured and you had no, you had no ways to like sustain your living outside of that. That's right. Crazy. Jesus Christ, that is that is crazy. But I'm I'm glad she's back though. That's that's great news. I'm glad she's back. So definitely looking forward to that. So 245 is gonna be fire. Uh, speaking of fire, another fight I'm looking uh, forward to at UFC South Korea will have Volkan Uzdemir versus Alexander Rachik. Always great when there's a 205 fight like outside of Jones that like you're actually looking forward to. <laughs> so I'm happy for that one. That should be a really fun fight. Um at UFC Moscow, uh <laughs> some interesting happened. So like last week we came on here and had to let you guys know that Zabit had to pull out of the fight with Calvin uh Cater. Fights back on. And it's at UFC Moscow. So three weeks later. Right. <laughs> So, you know, uh, I ain't going to say nothing, but, you know, you connect some dots. You read between some lines, you know. Might be uh, something there. Might be I, something there. I, I feel horrible for Calvin Cater because he misses a shot to fight in front of his home crowd in Boston. And now he has to go all the way to fucking Russia. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying, sounds like a setup. Sounds like a setup. But... The beat versus Calvin Cater is back on at UC Moscow, so at least it's a fight again. Just you know, I, I think uh, I, I um I want to say the UFC was like this is one of those instances where like MMA is like strangely fortunate for like it like the the spirit of MMA is strangely like benefits the UFC, but at the same time it like. It just feels dirty. Yeah, yeah. Well, as soon as I saw that announcement, I was like, mm, mm-hmm, I see what's going on here. Because I see the rest of this card, and it's not good. Um, I think there's somebody at the door. I have to go answer that. All right, I'll, oh. I'll just keep rattling off fights. All right. <laughs> but uh, continuing also at UFC Moscow, we will have Jessica Rose Clark versus Panny Kianzad, and we will also have Anthony Rocco Martin versus Ramazan Ameev. Um, at UFC Copenhagen, ah, at UFC Copenhagen, we will have Giga, uh, God, I, I'm going to butcher this name, and of course, the Antaku left right when I need help with the name pronouncement, uh, name pronouncing, uh, Giga Chickadees. I probably said that wrong, but he was a former glory kickboxer. Um, he will be making his, uh, not his MMA debut, but his UFC debut against Brandon Davis, which I guess, you know, pretty good debut matchup. He'll get a chance to showcase his striking because you, 
with Brandon Davis, you kind of know what you're going to get. He, he's just here to throw hands, and that'll give Giga a chance to get off whatever he wants to get off. He'll have probably every opportunity in the world to to showcase his striking. So that'll be going down at UFC Copenhagen. Um, at UFC 244, we will have Shane Burgos uh, versus Maquan Amir Khani. That should be a really awesome fight. Yeah. Um, I'm back. There we go. <laughs> yep, apparently, I have a ghost. <laughs> I mean, really? Door. Yes. Because I heard the doorbell ring. <laughs> yeah, no, it has a ghost because there was nobody there. And it's not even like they were, it's not even like a ding dong ditch situation because we have a camera. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. All right. Stan Takul disappears uh, <sighs> at some point during this podcast. I probably deserve it. <laughs> it's the ghost um, of Jack May coming back to haunt me. <laughs> a bare knuckle ghost. That is terrifying. <laughs> but um, I guess I'll circle back because you stepped away for a second. Because uh, you, you brought up uh, Giga. Uh... Yeah, okay, all right, so you can't say it either. All right, so we both. <laughs> I mean, when your first name's Giga, do you really need a last name? Right. <laughs> so I was just going to say, because you had brought him up uh, last podcast, so he's, he'll be fighting Brandon Davis at UFC Copenhagen. Ooh. So he'll have a chance to showcase, uh, you know. Some kickboxing. Yeah, there won't hopefully. be no takedowns in that fight. I mean, you say that, but maybe Davis has learned. Nah. <laughs> then, then again, that might threaten his job security. Yeah, you got. Yeah, you got to go out there with the. Like he, he shoots for a takedown. Dana White just hops in the in the cage. Like immediately, doesn't even wait for the fight to. It's like you're not here to take people down. Right. <laughs> you stand up and you take that ass whooping. <laughs> Man. You see Dana walk in and do the rough wave off. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon Davis has Giga in like full mount. <laughs> Dana just jumps in like, nah, it fight's over. Oh, man. Um, and then the last fight I mentioned, uh, right when you came back, was Shane Burgos versus uh, Mac Juan Americani at UFC 244. Um, I'll come back to the UFC news. Um, actually, one of the news is kind of a fight announcement, but I'll, I'll circle back. After I finish the rest of these. Um, so that's all I have for UFC fight announcements. And then Bellator actually has a couple of fight announcements going on. Um, at Bellator Dublin, you'll have James Gallagher versus Roman Salazar. Um, at Bellator 231, uh, Jack Swagger will be back. He will be facing off against a gentleman named Anthony Garrett. And Beck Rawlings will be making her Bellator debut against Elena Joanne. Uh, at Bellator 229, we'll have Carrie Melendez versus Mandy Polk. At Bellator 232, the homie, former Glory featherweight and lightweight champion, Robin Van Roosmalen, will be making his promotional debut against Chris Linciani. Um, Wait, is that uh, the, the Italian card? I guess so. Uh, is, that, so is, is, is that the kickboxing card? Or one of the two MMA cards happening? No, it should day? be. I think it's the MMA one. Okay. It should be. That's, that seems like... If I got like one of the best kickboxers in the world, I'd probably put them in my kickboxing organization. Though I understand why they'd want him on the one that's probably going to get broadcast on TV. Yeah, and the one that they actually like pay attention to and acknowledge. They're like, <laughs> yeah. they they just go to Robin and they're like, Robin, this is this is strictly for the Italians. All right. Georgia Petrosian gets to fight here, not you. <laughs> but glad we'll get to see him. Dev always down for. Uh... Robin fight. Interested to see how his, excuse me, his uh, MMA career goes. And it's, uh, for some signees for Bellator, um, they finally signed Nick Newell to a multi-fight contract. Uh, so that's awesome. And a little bit of news that I randomly stumbled upon yesterday. Uh, former UFC and Combates America bantamweight Eric Perez signed with Bellator. Oh, great. Yeah, I've been awesome. saying forever that Bellator should find, sign like a really good like Hispanic fighter. There we go. So I, I, that was cool to see. I was happy to see him. Uh, happy to see that sign. Another well, random. Eric Perez is still out here. Yeah, right, right. I was yeah, I was just happy to see his name like in a headline. Like he's still, he's still out here fighting. So that's that's awesome. A, a fight that I randomly wrote down that I probably won't even watch. Oh, you know I'm lying. I might watch it. <laughs> I saw Puds's name in a headline. I was like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta write this down. Yeah. Yeah, Puds is back. Uh, the goat. Yeah, Puds is back. If you guys don't know, Marius uh, 
Pudzanowski. If I'm saying that right, probably said that wrong. But uh, he will be facing off at KSW 51 against a gentleman named Urko Jun or Jun, uh, who is some kind of Bos I think he's Bosnian bodybuilder or something. Yeah. <laughs> this is a, he's a he, he's he's a big Bosnian guy, I guess. Um, but that's going down at KSW 51. Go support Puds. Uh, and the last set of fight announcements uh, come from Ryzen, their lightweight Grand Prix, which goes down um, on Ryzen 19th at on October 12th. Um, we will have Tofik Musayev versus Damian Brown, Johnny Case versus Roberto Souza, Patricky Pitbull versus Tatsuya Kawajiri, and Luis Gustavo versus Hiroto Usako, if I said that correct. Um, so that'll be awesome. That's once again, Rise of 19th, October 12th. This is the year of the Grand Prix. Um, well, except for the UFC, they're, apparently they're too, they're too cool to do Grand Prix. But, mm -hmm. uh... <laughs> <laughs> they don't have tough anymore, so it's not even like they have any type of tournament. Right. <laughs> UFC is just too cool for Grand Prix. Even though they have divisions that would probably thoroughly benefit from having one. Or even just from an entertainment factor. Like, they haven't, you know... Dude, I, how long have I been saying that they should have a, like a women's gaunt, like bantamweight gauntlet where like just all the women with like less than three fights in the UFC just have to fucking face off of one another over the course of like a year, right? Like that. That's it. That that's how you get them experience and you like actually like build some type of anticipation around the division. But instead, they're like, no, we're just gonna have them fight like once a year and hope they get better. Mm. UFC going to UFC. Yeah. But uh, that Rising Lightweight Grand Prix, I'm digging it. I'm liking those matchups. Uh, cool to see Patricky over there. So that'll that'll be dope. So that's going down. Um, so I really like these fight announcements. There's a lot, a lot of good fights coming up. Yeah. And as far as uh, news, uh, one, of the, one of these stories I kind of don't even want to acknowledge. Um, I don't care. He's still the GOAT. Uh, but David Branch got suspended for two years. And they got anti fired. Yeah, yeah. Anti-doping violation. I didn't even look up to see what he took, um, because I want for one, I probably can't announce it, uh, pronounce it anyway. So, what's the point? Um, for two, it's a lie. <laughs> right. <laughs> two. Dave Branch is an upstanding citizen. Uh, he is a man of honor. He was dual wielding belts before it was cool. Um, I would not acknowledge this drug test. Because I just choose not to acknowledge it. And, exactly. Uh, but the UFC did, so. And they're uh, whack for it. Yeah, they're, they're trash. You know. Um. So what if he took a... Uh, let, me, let me see. Let me see what's going on. Uh, yep, he's been released from his contract. I'm trying to see if they say... Uh, he failed an out-of-competition test. For Ipa Morellin, a growth hormone, uh, he is not eligible to fight again until July of 2021. Uh, it says it's likely that he'll go overseas, <laughs> where his suspension will not not be honored due to lack of commission oversight. So he probably can't fight in North America, but if he wants to go overseas, he can, uh, you know, he can go overseas and do his thing. So. uh... David Brandt versus Anglosome. David Brandt versus uh uh what's the dude's name in Rising? Jury uh Jury Pro Prochaska. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's all I want. Y yoked up freaking Dave Branch versus Jerry Prochaska. Make it happen. Let's do it. There's no drug testing in Japan, just for weed. Right. right. You good, you good, David Branch. You'll still be out here. You're still the goat. Uh so that happened. And in the last bit of news, which is kind of a fight announcement also, um, it looks like we will be getting Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Miocic 3. At some um, point. Yeah, that is, it seems like that is currently in the works. Don't know what card, don't know when it's going to happen, but uh, that seems like it is going to be a thing. So, I'll, I'll probably have more to say about that fight when it actually gets. Announced because I feel like that could turn into a whole conversation about DC's legacy, and I feel like there'll be a lot to happen. But I'll hold off on that until we 
actually get like an official date and we know exactly when it's going to go down so but that'll be a thing right and uh, uh <laughs> some random breaking nfl news uh, apparently antonio brown is angry at the patriots and the steelers and apparently he said he wants out of the nfl i mean he, he's jobless now right so well teams can sign him if they want to but uh he said, according to Twitter, will not be playing in the NFL anymore. These owners can cancel deals, do whatever they want at any time. We will see if the NFLPA hold them accountable. Sad they can just void guarantees anytime. Going on 40 M. Is that 40 mil? 40 mil, two months? We'll see if they pay. Whatever. I don't know. He's mad. He's angry. And he said he's not playing for the NFL anymore. So if you got him on your fantasy squad, shout outs to you. You played yourself. Uh, probably won't be seeing him for a while. Was he just accused of, like, rape? Uh, he, uh, he had a sexual assault case. Uh, okay. The, he had two of them. The first one got thrown out, I think, because uh, I think they said statute of limitations. Ew. And I don't know about the second one. Like, the second one, I think, like, just... That one's kind of fresh. Like, that one kind of just popped up. I don't know what's going on with that one. Um, yeah, he, he's a mess, though. He's, uh... I think we're witnessing, like, a... <laughs> it's, it's sad. Like, some of the most talented guys just have these career meltdowns. And yeah, I think he's just going to be one of those guys. But it is what it is. But moving on. That's all we got, I, I, got for... I, I, got, so. I got one bit of boxing news that probably only me and the Irish will care about. Um, Katie Taylor. Moving up to 140 pounds to face off of Christina Lennar Datu for the WBO title um, in November. Um, I get, that means that we won't be seeing the uh, the rematch between her and Delphine Pursun or a fight with Amanda Serrano in the immediate future, unfortunately. Um, and I mean, do we do we want to talk about Rashad? Oh man, yeah, I forgot that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Rashad Evans um, had previously, what was this, like last year, announced his retirement from MMA. Um, but I have to think about it. Uh, you know, he, he sat on it for a year. He thought about it. He, re- uh, he came to the conclusion that he still had it. That he's going to keep going. So he asked for his release from the... Uh, well, I don't think he asked for his release. I think he was done after his last fight. Um, so he is no longer signed to the UFC. And he is currently pursuing other options uh, to compete. Yeah. Uh... So, I want, I, I want to start off this conversation by just th- reflecting on something that I think I posted at some point yesterday. Um, I don't think people realize how incredibly hard it is to monetize your fight career after you're done fighting. Like, it's, how long did it take Tyson to realize that he was, like, a meme that could, like, <laughs> right, you know, do movies and, like, have a TV show based around his, like, basically a, uh, a caricature of himself. But, like, Ali, famously bad with his money after, like, retirement, but, like, he tried to do all types of stuff. Like, he had his own soda line, his own TV show. Like, I, I want to say he made his own... Like, he had, like, a clothing line and everything, but none of it took off. Like, there is a reason Oscar De La Hoya and Floyd Mayweather, like, their primary jobs after they stopped fighting was to become fight promoters. You're right. It's because, like, once you get outside the realm of combat sports, it is super hard to make money off your name. Like, this isn't like the NBA where, like, Allen Houston can go be, like, the general manager of the New York Knicks G League and still make, like, a six-figure salary. All right. Like, I, I think Rashad was working... Has Rashad been working the desk for um, ESPN or uh, Fight uh, Fight Pass or anything? I feel like I haven't seen him in a little... I mean, he might do a show here and there, but... Yeah. Like, and this isn't like the NBA or the NFL where, like, there are 30 teams and they all have their own, like, little affiliate stations where they need right. commentators. Like, I know, uh, what's his name? Keith Van Horn gets to work the, je- the desk at MSG on the uh, the MSG network here in New York. Um, 
or in the New York area. Um, so like that's a job for him. Like, you know, you work 80 days out the year, get a nice little paycheck and you can go on about your life. Um, like there, there's nothing like that. If you're a, a, a former fighter, like I, like it, it took the Diaz brothers being like these complete outliers in like cannabis culture to actually get a deal where they could sustain themselves outside of fighting. And they still came back because he realized there was just more money in fighting. Like two months of work and you get paid six, seven figures. Right. Um, if you have that kind of popularity. Yeah, yeah. Um, or you have that type of leverage. Right. Um, but, like, it's wild. Like, it, it's, like, and no offense to Rashad, but, like, he, he's not a D-ass-type personality. He, he's right. not, like, I'm, like, he's a good dude and everything, and I'm sure he's, like, a fun guy to talk to, but it's, it's not. he's not, like, Shaq. Right. He's not a guy who, like, we're, I say we, not us in specific, but, like, I guess in general, you're not clamming to have Rashad sit at your desk. I guess like you or run your like um, I don't know deodorant commercials or whatever. Like he he is not an, an, like uh, unless you are a fight fan. Rashad Evans is not a dude who is like it, mind you. This is a dude who sold like a million pay per views at one point for his fight with uh, Rampage. Right. But like he's not a dude who you're gonna see walk like, like walking down the street and just gonna be surrounded by like a sea of people. Like I'm sure he can go most places without being hassled. Yeah, that that life after fighting is always just <clears throat> you really worry about guys sometimes because it's just like and it's probably MMA is one of those sports that requires so I mean really any sport like requires so much dedication in terms of time and you like. You gotta be in shape. Like it's it's really a full time job, and it sucks because these guys don't, you know, unless you're in that top like one percent, you're not making you know that retirement money. Like <laughs> you're not making those millions, you know, every fight where you can kind of, you know, if you're not fighting for a year or two, your pockets aren't hurting. Right. Like there are guys sitting who probably play like. A handful of minutes a game in the uh, in the NBA, who make more a year than most UFC fighters will make in their entire careers. Right, they're still pulling in six figures easy. Yeah, not not doing anything. <laughs> they just travel with the team. And, and then when they're done, they can go be like, uh, uh, like if you're a shooter, you can go be like a, a, a jump shot coach at an AAU in an AAU league or something. You know right. what I mean? Like, or you can go to college. You can you can go overseas. Like there there are a lot of options. Like just to where like. MMA is really you can start your own camp, but that's that's a lot of money. Like yeah, a lot that's not, a lot that's of not money. a guarantee that that'll even you know yeah, it's, and there's no guarantee that you're like one a good coach or two like you're, that like it's not like Nike's going to be paying for your camp. Like Nike's not going to give you fifty thousand dollars to come in and train like a bunch of like thirteen year olds for two weeks like they do uh, with basketball players and football players so yeah it's it's rough it's rough like oh you want to i want to be optimistic and hope that best case scenario is he's not struggling for money like i i don't think he's struggling for money but i think he's like i'm only what he's 30 he's 40 years old he's got kids like I, i i don't think he's married anymore but he has kids like I don't know what he's invested his money in, like. But I'm sure I'm sure he's not broke. But I'm sure he's like I'm sitting around. I'm not making as much money as I used to. Where I used to put in a couple months of work and I get this big, like, nice little fat paycheck every couple months. Like, what am I doing? All right. Like, this is a dude who spent how much of his? <clears throat> he spent like the last all fifteen years of his life just fighting. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I wasn't thrilled when I saw the headline, just kind of worrying about the dude's health. I mean, like, he ended his career on, like, a six-fight losing streak or something crazy like that. 
And it's, uh... You know what the really sad part is? Like, before he went away in 2014, because he, I think he tore his ACL. Like, he was on, like, he looked good. Like, before the Bader fight. Like, not, like, great. Not, like, champion. Like, but, like, somebody who could probably go another, like, five, six years. Right. But, like, I think that just took everything everything he had out of him after that. Like, the knockout losses started piling up. You get boxed up by both Sam Alvey and Daniel Kelly. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's a and, cruel sport, man. Yeah, and, like, <laughs> I, I'm... I... I I worry about, like, all these dudes who are going to eventually be in, like, Rashad's place. Because, like, at a certain point, it, it doesn't matter how popular you are. Unless you're, like, Conor McGregor or Ronda Rousey. Like, what do you do next? Right. After you spend 20 years of your life doing this. All right. And a sport that, unless, like we mentioned, if you're not at the top... You're not making, like, that life-changing money. Hell, and even if you are at the top, sometimes that life-changing money isn't a lot. Um, did you All read right. Josh Nash's uh, article about what the top fighters in the UFC got paid? Mm. It was not a lot. Also, I just want to point out something that he mentions in the article. So we know for a fact that the UFC, uh, on average, pays about 20% of its revenue to the fighters. All right. Uh, the top 20% of that, uh, I'm sorry, not the top 20%, the top 20 fighters receive about an 8, uh, a 9 to 10% share of that money. And that's not top as in, like, top ranking. That's top as in top paid. Mm. So, obviously, and obviously there's, like, a correlation there sometimes. But, like, if you're one of the bottom, like, 580 because there are like 600 fighters on the UFC roster now. If you're one of the bottom 580 UFC fighters, you are collectively sh- uh, sharing in something like 10 to 11 percent of the UFC revenue. Mm. So, yikes! Welcome to the big leagues. Right. <laughs> and on that note, let's uh, move on and uh, talk about some fights. What what a card! Um, I I really don't know how to describe what uh, happened last night. It it was amazing. Mark it Godbeard was... murdered Jack May, and and Mighty Mo destroyed Sokaju. It, it was it, it was a magical night. Sokaju, two thousand nineteen. He is a lot rounder than I remember him being. <laughs> For all you bare knuckle fans, you guys had your, your fill. Yo, he 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 had the stepdad bod, <laughs> not the regular dad. No, no, <laughs> he he leveled up. Oh man, this is mom's rebound, dude. <laughs> oh boy, equally man. old but kind of still in shape. <laughs> He's hanging on to that last ab. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so you bare knuckle uh, fanatics. You guys had your your fill uh, yesterday. That was the thing. Uh, and then there was also UFC Mexico City, which um, mm, what a card! What a card! What a what an event! The the highest of highs, the lowest of lows, and everything in between. Um, I was so mad. <laughs> I was so mad last night. I was supposed to, like, take notes after the car was over for the podcast. And I just stared at my screen for an absurdly long time. And I was like, I don't want to watch MMA anymore. <laughs> I was so just distraught. The main event and co-main event took a lot out of me. Uh, this car. It, it took a lot. But, you know what, man? We got to come here. We got to talk about it. This is what we do. So, uh, let's just run this from the top. UFC Mexico City, uh, obviously going down in Mexico City. Uh, headline by Yair Rodriguez versus Jeremy Stevens. Um, 
before I even get to the fight, before we even, oh, you know, there was no fight. I can't even really use that word. How dare you? Um, <laughs> before we get to the unfortunate happenings of that main event, <clears throat> um, first I just got a uh, shout out to Stokes, uh, who uh, informed us yesterday, which I had no clue of, that Jeremy Stevens does have uh, Mexican in his bloodline, apparently. Um, apparently his mom is Mexican, so there's some uh, connection there. But I found it very weird <laughs> that the UFC tried really absurdly hard to push this, I'm going to call it the Jeremy Stevens uh, is Mexican initiative. Uh, to like prove his heritage and it came off very uncomfortable and very cringeworthy and I'm not doubting that he has Mexican in his bloodline Um, I'm just saying that I and I could be wrong I'm always up to being wrong I've never heard him rep it at all have you uh he did wear the Mexican fight kit back in like 2015 if uh, I just looked up a tweet from Mark Romaldi from 2015 explaining it but Like, and, and here's the thing, like, uh, identity is hard and complicated in this global world we live in. But, like, having him shadow box in front of the Mexican flag stating Mexican fighters like to give it their all and brawl and, like, go on the shield, it comes off as really cheap. Yeah, and then they... <laughs> like, so... He, he would throw in a random... Spanish word yeah. every like, <laughs> like every twenty seconds, and then the line that took me out, I almost cut the whole broadcast off when he starts bringing up bringing up his team, and he's like, "My head coach is Mexican," and then they pan to Dominic Cruz, and I can't even remember the exact thing he said, but they brought up like Cruz's middle name to like push that as oh I'm like surrounded by Mexicans, and I I, I cringe <laughs> really hard <laughs> like. It, you know what it sounded like? It it sounded like that guy you know who like tries to like prove his coolness, like, or like that guy who says like, and I'm not saying Jeremy Stevens is racist. I don't know him, but like you know the lot of like when people say I'm not racist, I have five black friends. I'm, I'm, it felt like that. I, I have Native American ancestry. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That that's the much better. It, that's that's the vibe I was getting. Yeah. And there is a thing. His mom is Mexican. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not doubting that. Is it the way they like there, there's a way to go about it that doesn't seem like oh we're going to Mexico. Um, here you're Mexican now. Right. <laughs> Here's your sombrero and your little freaking poncho. Right. It it, it it seemed like it was low hanging fruit. It was very that that kind of disturbed me. So like <laughs> a couple a, a few years ago, there was a Johnny Hendricks thing where he found like he was like I discovered I had Native American heritage. Blah blah blah, and like, I don't think this had to do anything particular. I think this was just something that had happened in Johnny Hendricks' life during his camp, and they filmed it. And it was like he went, he went to go visit like the the um, I guess the reservation where the the tribe that his bloodline comes from it was, and he spoke with the people there. And it was like it was like a, a thing where like you could see like Hendricks like learning and embracing his culture right. that he didn't know anything about. It, it, it didn't come off as cheap. It, it came off as like, oh, uh, we're following Johnny Hedges' career from the time he like got to UFC, and like this is how he's changed as a person. This is him growing and learning more about himself and how that reflects in the cage. This was just this. This seems like this, I, I I hate using the p word, but this was straight up pandering. No, yeah, this this was pandering to the. To the umpteenth degree. But this wasn't even, like, <laughs> pandering to, like, Mexicans. Because I feel like if you're, like, a Mexican fight fan, you see right through it. This is, like, pandering to, like, I don't even know who. I, this, yeah. this seems like some, like, ugh. It was rough. It, 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 it came off weird and yeah. unsettling. And not endearing and like they wanted it to. For listeners, if you wonder why we're spending so much time on this, because that... Is probably more interesting than what happened in the actual. <laughs> but, I mean, I think what happened in the actual fight was pretty interesting. It just wasn't good. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's 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 get to it. All all the fifteen seconds uh, of how long this fight lasted. So 
So Yaya Rodriguez versus Jeremy Stevens. We're all looking forward to it. Great style matchup. Great, uh, great main, really a great main event. Like it was a really good matchup. You got Yaya, who's obviously they throwing him in front of his hometown in Mexico. I think this is like I ain't gonna say a setup fight, but this is the fight where you want the young guy to win because you're trying to build a star. Right. And Jeremy Stevens, who you know brings it every fight, he's trying to kill dudes. He's trying to knock their heads off. It's a really good matchup. So we get to this main event. Everybody's ready for blood. We're ready for violence. We know. We know. We just know we're about to witness something crazy. And all we got in 15 seconds, uh, they they came forward. There was a leg kick by uh, Yair, and then there was a push off. And then in between the push off, I guess a finger slid into Jeremy Stevens' eye and swiped it. Um, obviously the fight stops. You know he's in the corner trying to get his eye right. Herb Dean's talking to him, and God bless Herb Dean who catches a lot of heat. But boy, I felt like he did a great job. <laughs> I, I felt like he he knew what was gonna happen if this fight like ended so quick, and he was trying his absolute hardest to give Stevens all the time he needed. He was talking to the doctors like we can give him more time, give him his full five minutes. He was trying so hard to just save this fight, I guess. Right. Um, but Stevens literally could not open his eye um, after the five minutes. Like the you, like the doctor literally tried to like I don't say pry the eye open but no he did you know, he did yeah, yeah well yeah and, and it just it would not open his eye would not open and the uh, fight gets waved off uh, bottles start flying into the octagon poor uh, what's the the, the announcer name Brendan Fitzgerald I think yeah his name uh, he was I don't know if you saw the video he was hiding under the desk <laughs> <laughs> like literally he ducked under the desk. When they started throwing bottles and stuff at the octagon, Yair is having like a conniption in there. He's angry. He was weird though. Like there was one shot where I thought he was really angry, and then the next moment he was celebrating. I don't know what happened. It was. I don't know if he was celebrating so much as he was trying to like, not not. I don't want to say calm the crowd, but like calm his nerves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it it was a lot of emotion, a lot just. Not the way you want to see your main event in. Right. And I'll just go out here and say as much as we talked about Stevens during this little uh, Mexican initiative spiel. Um, I'm I'm not. I I don't think it makes any sense to say that he wanted out of the fight. It's not like a fight where like they had a whole grueling five rounds and oh this is the last couple minutes and he wants an out. Like brother, fight literally just started. Like it literally just started. Dude, like Jeremy Stevens spent like. Seven hours a day training with Tony fucking Ferguson. And he spent like $30,000 on this camp. Like, there's no... You're not going to convince me he wanted out of this fight. Right. Like... Yeah. That's just... That just doesn't make sense. Like, who... Like, this man was training with Tony Ferguson at like 1 o'clock in the morning, lifting weights on like a mountainside, prepping <laughs> for this right. fight. Watching Rocky Four reruns. Like, he, he's been through it. Like he is not right. out here looking for an easy out. He, he 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 wants all the smoke. And to draw a parallel, obviously I'm not a fighter, but I've had eye injuries before. Nothing major like that, but there's a difference between getting hit in your eye and the area around your eye swelling up. And there's a difference between that and then having your literal eye get scraped. Like those are very different feelings. Right. You can get your eyes swollen and still like kind of open it. It's going to hurt, but you can open it. But if you get your literal eye scraped, like that's a whole different issue. Um, I've never had it so bad that I literally couldn't open my eye, but I've I've like accidentally like brushed my eye against my face. I mean, brushed like my hand against my face cuz I'm clumsy and like somehow like hit like somehow like gently like scrape my eye and it's like, ah, that kind of, you know, I've had it happen on, on a much, much, much smaller scale, but yeah, th those are two completely different things. Right, right. Um, like, as for the crowd reaction, like, obviously, not classy, not good luck, Mexico City, but like to all the people I see like making all these like racist ass uh, comments on like the Mexico City crowd. The UFC, I think this, either the last or the one before last UFC I attended here in Jersey, the car was so bad 
the audience got into a fist fight and one dude stabbed two people. So like, could we not? Uh, let's not pretend like this is like a Mexico City problem only. Yeah, we we don't set we we, we don't set some kind of golden standard. Like you're, yeah, yeah, but like at the same time, there was no need to. And I get it, and this and this isn't like me trying to rationalize or sympathize with them, but like three of the previous four Mexican fighters on the card either lost or didn't win. Um, yeah, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, some some of it by their own design. Um, but like, it it, it it was not a good night overall in Mexico City. Yeah. And you you know probably paid a little decent amount of money to come out here and like you wanted to see your guy fight. Right. Not only did you not get to see him fight, like it ended in like the. I was gonna say blink of an eye, boy. That was a... This was this was a two <laughs> fighter card, and the two fighters were Alexa Grasso and Yaya Rodriguez. And it was probably more just a one fighter card, if we're being honest, because I, I don't know how big Alexa Grasso is in Mexico City, but y- Yair is somebody who I think has fought there before, right? Like in the UFC. I think so. Uh, was it the Caceres fight? I want to say it was a Caceres fight because that was a main event. Or was that in Utah? That was in Utah. All right. The point B, he's fought there before. He's probably the biggest name Mexican fighter there on the UFC roster, unless you count Cain Velasquez. Um, and he got, and they got to see all of 15 seconds from him. Yeah. Like, again, not trying to, you know talk away what uh, the crowd did but at the same time like it's a bunch of drunk angry people who didn't even get to see what they paid for so how am I watching <laughs> yeah I just uh... I just forgot for a second that mascots were a thing in sports and I saw this like gigantic <laughs> mascot on the side of a bus I'm like am I watching an ad for furries <laughs> meanwhile I'm scrolling down the timeline I see an old highlight of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar knocking out somebody in a basketball game <laughs> that was a nice punch <laughs> but um yeah this main event just uh yeah um not I mean not really a lot to say I mean I, I guess all you can say with the aftermath is uh you know, you just got to run it back. I, I, if I'm Jeremy Stevens, I'm not taking that fight again, to be honest with you. The dude poked me in the eye not even 15 seconds into the fight. Like, why does he deserve to fight me? Go make him fight, like, Hanada Moicano or something. But knowing the UFC, they'll probably want to rebook the fight. No, they're, they're going to rebook it. That's going to be Well, we'll see, man. Yeah, this could this... be a genius move from Yair Rodriguez. If we're being honest, like, Jeremy Stevens comes back hella mad and just starts to fight dumb like he does, like, half the time <laughs> he fights. It's the master plan. It's the, it, this was the whole, this was, this was, um, yeah, this was the goal. Get Stevens really mad and then beat him in the rematch when he does something stupid because he's very upset. He's got, he got another elbow trick up his sleeve. Yeah. Mm, master plan at work. I see you out here. Thought he had a tool. <sighs> But that 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 was probably the most um, probably the most MMA ending um, in recent memory that I can say I've seen to a card. Kind of mad that we didn't see it coming, to be honest with you, because like Jair, like he there is just this is like all this wackiness that comes with his career. It's hilarious. Oh, oh, like him getting fired and rehired like three weeks later. Yeah, yeah. Oh, boy. his spinning shit war with like Bruce Leroy, <laughs> knocking out Korean Zombie at literally the last pox- possible second in a fight he was almost certainly about to lose. Yeah, yeah, right. Like, I mean. 
Guess when he shows up, the party don't start till Yair walk in. I'm I'm waiting on the kick to a downed opponent to hit my bingo on the card. <laughs> That's the that happens in the rematch. We get like a four round war, and then at four minutes and forty nine seconds, he gets DQ'd because <laughs> he thinks soccer kicks are legal. Oh boy, but um, it is what it is, man. I don't, I don't really know what to say. Uh, that 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 ended the card terribly for me. I was literally just staring at my computer screen. I was supposed to be taking notes for the podcast, and I just stared at my screen like, "What? What am I doing with my life right now? <laughs> like, what is what is what is life? What is MMA? What is this sport? Who who got me into this? Like, how did I get here? But like the rest of us, very slowly. Right. right. <laughs> now I'm just. I'm a prisoner. Yeah. Whatever. It is what it is. But that was the main event. It lasted 15 seconds. I poke. No contest. They'll probably run it back. Whatever. <laughs> I don't got nothing. Moving on. To a co-main event. To a fight that actually did happen. Went all three rounds. Went the distance. It was an actual scrap that we can talk about. Uh, Women's straw weight. Carla Esparza versus Alexa Grasso. Um, Whew. What a um, mm. like it was a it was a great fight. Like, oh yeah, it was a fantastic uh, fight. Yeah, from an entertainment standpoint, this was an this was an awesome fight. But like, from from a from a Grasso fan standpoint, like girl, what is you doing? <laughs> and uh, I'm trying. Uh, uh, like I, I can't <laughs> imagine like. So I don't know if it, like I can't even put the blame on Lobo because like they were at least like from the parts I heard they were at least right about certain things and Alexa Grasso was just like no I'm gonna do my own thing and her own thing was to basically just chase the loss over and over and over and over again and I'll I'll preface this. By saying, um, like, I, I don't want to pile on her. And how old is she? She's like 20. She's, she's really young. She's not that young. I think she's like 26. She's like early 20s. Oh, she's, I don't know. I thought she's like 23, 24. She was when we first like heard about her. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm, ah, so I can't even really. I mean, she is. Ah, this is so frustrating to, to talk about. Like, God, she has, like, all the talent in the world. And, like, there were moments. We, we saw moments in this fight where it was, like, I think we saw, like, how good she can be. And then we saw other moments where it was just, like, oh, my God, I can't believe you're doing that. I can't believe you're doing this to me. And this was one of those fights where I, I, knew, I, I knew I was, in the back of my mind, I had it in my head that, like, there is a good chance that Esparza could just take her down and beat her up and this fight be extremely frustrating. And you know what? I honestly would have accepted that because I know how good Esparza is. And I think she's actually has gotten a lot better also within the last couple of years. And she still is a, a, a really good fighter. So I was I would have been perfectly I'd have been frustrated, but I would have been okay if if Grasso just would have shown moments, but maybe Esparza, kind of like that Calvillo fight, where it's like, I know we think of Esparza like the former champ, and some people think she didn't really deserve that, but I'd have been okay if it was like, you know what, Esparza's just better. It is what it is. And this fight, I, uh, I don't think it was that Esparza, was, and I don't really want to undercut what Esparza did, because she fought a really great fight. It just felt like, I don't know if it was so much as Esparza was better as much it was Alexa Grasso just kind of like he just threw the fight out the window. So then maybe that guess that means as far as it is just better. So I, I guess I would just have to give her credit because I mean, first round they come out. I noticed that Grasso's kind of in a lower boxing stance. I'm like, all right, she she knows the takedowns are coming, and. She's able to work on the feet for a little bit, but as soon as the spars are shot for that first double, like, she got it ASAP. And it's like, all right, this this is frustrating, but I guess I kind of expected this. But, I mean, 
I, it was okay at first because at least I saw Grasso like trying to do something off of her back, show that she was at least working on that part of her game. So I'm like, all right, cool. You're not trying to be like super complacent, you know. So all right, points points for that, I guess. But you know, once the Sparza gets a takedown, probably not gonna be a good good day for you. Um, so I think I'm pretty I'm pretty sure I gave a Sparza the first. Um, and as far as his hands, hands have gotten better. Not great, but he's willing to throw him a little more. Then I think, God, what happened in the second round? Um, I feel like there were some 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 scrambles, but um, like when Grasso once again would have moments on the feet, she's landing good shots. <clears throat> you know, you kind of know what as far as is gonna do. Um, and it was the second round when she rocked her, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. she, she rocked her in the second and the third, but it, it was a big right hand as, um, I don't know what as far as it was doing. She might have been trying to go for, like, a front kick, but, like, Grasso just tagged her with her right hand over the yeah. top. And this is where, like, the fight got extremely frustrating. So, because she, I don't think she did, she didn't rock as far as I think until later in the round. It was literally, like, the last minute of the yeah. round. So, up until that point. I think it's pretty clear, like, as far as is winning this fight. Um, it's a great fight so far, but it's like, as far as is getting takedown, she's having more control. She's winning this. So you would think in the back of your mind, you got to know, like, all right, I kind of need to, the, the fight's getting in the latter half. I, I got to make something happen because I'm probably, you don't want to leave this up to the judges. I'm probably down on scorecards right now. I got to do something. And then she has her moment where she rocks as far as a, Sparza's clearly wobbled. She tagged her a couple more times. Sparza had to, like, back off. And it's like, all right, Grasso, you got some momentum. Like, you might be able to end this right here. Like, you know, y'all have had a pretty grueling fight. You know, I ain't gonna say Sparza's gas, but this is the one moment where you gotta put your pedal to the metal, man. You gotta go. You gotta, you gotta make something happen. And she rocks the Sparza, tags her maybe two or three more times and then literally just kind of just let her recover like literally just let her just didn't rush in didn't go for the kill you know what? i'm gonna just let this happen i'm gonna just let her get her wits back about her and i was just i wanted to scream so loud because i just i did not i don't un, I, <laughs> I get so mad just thinking about it like what were you doing like I, and I get it, like, you were, you know, you're obviously thinking about the shot, but at the end, I want to say, I don't remember if it was the same round, but, like, I think after she had gotten stunned, Esparza went for another takedown, and, and Grasso stuffed it, like, easily stuffed it, yep. and it's like, bro, she's tired, she is, she's out of it right now, like, these takedowns that she was getting, I don't to say easily, kind of easily, they're not working right now. Like this is go time. This is it. You got a window. You gotta. You gotta go. And she she did the opposite. She took her foot off the brake and went in reverse. Like <laughs> like like what are you doing? Like what are you doing? Ah oh god, god, just uh yeah. Um, let her foot off the gas. Got let her spars are completely off the hook. And uh, was the third round the armbar? That was the armbar round, right? Yeah, she. So she actually did get an armbar pretty deep in the second round at the end of it. But it was also the end of the round. So, like, you know. Yeah, she didn't get a chance to, like, fully extend on it. Yeah. Like but it, it was the third round, uh, like a minute and a half left in the fight, where uh, she goes for the armbar. Like, so so we should, we should probably mention how she gets to this position. As far as it shoots. Um. Grasso somehow gets like her arm behind her and is like, you know what? We're going for a crucifix <laughs> from the back. And she goes to bring her legs to Grasso's arm, misses, and ends up on the bottom in guard. But then she's able to spin her... Uh, she has one of Esparza's arms, like, stuck. So she's able to actually create the space to get the arm bar. But Esparza has tiny arms. Like, super tiny arms. 
that are really hard to get leverage on. And while she does get a lot of torque on it, her arms are also super flexible. So she's able to just spin through and get back on top. Yep. Like, they get up again, and Grasso tags Esparza down the stretch. But, like, oh, my, oh my God. She, she never really pours it on. Yeah. She, she's just super hesitant. And it was like she had... I, I felt like this this is a fight to just highlight what missed opportunities look like. Like, you probably had more than one chance to put this fight away and you... It's one thing if you go for it and don't get it. But, like, you just didn't... You didn't try to finish the job. Exactly. And as far as against a lesser skilled opponent, you might have gotten away with it and still got the win. Against as far as you can't do that. Like, you you can't. <laughs> you let as far as back in, and I mean we saw it. You let as far as back in the fight. She's gonna get back in the fight. I mean she was winning the fight anyway. Like you had a chance to just take the momentum back, and you just you just didn't. Like you had the chance and you didn't. And every moment that you didn't, as far as was able to capitalize on it. And get the momentum back. And it's just... Ah! Yeah, that that fight. Blood pressure through the roof. Through the roof. And it's not it's not that I don't even like... It's not that I don't like Esparza. I'm just a big Grasso fan. And I thought this would have been a huge win. And it just... Can't even say it slipped through your fingers. You just threw it away. Just... Yeah. Like... And just go back to that first like round and a half where as far as I was getting her down, like I never got the vibe that um like that Grasso couldn't get up. You know what I mean? Like right. she she was really good about getting her hips like off the mat so that or like turned so that she could, was like so she could fight for submissions, but she never thought like, Hey, I'm on my back against a wrestler. I like the box. Let me stand back up. I, I I don't get it. Why was she fighting off her back? Yeah. It, uh, it just seemed like it should have been one of those fights where you... I, I get it, you're trying to go for the armbar. You had a chance for it. But outside of that, you should have been trying to keep this on the feet. Like, after them, those takedowns got stuffed, after that, you know, mini slacking she put on her for about a, you know, all of 10 seconds, you should have been just trying to end it. Like, just trying to get her out of there. And I mean, as far as it landed some decent shots also on the feet, but you could tell technique for technique. If they would have kept throwing hands, it, it probably would have went Grasso's way. Right. And from what but, I understand, Grasso thinks she won the fight, so there is probably little chance that she's going to look back on this fight and be like, I should do anything differently. Yeah. Oh, boy. But... Props to uh, Esparza. Yeah, like, she is making herself into the 115-pound undersized version of Misha Tate. She just comes out here and guts has like all these gutsy performances. Right. Like, super scrappy. Like, never out of a fight. Just kind of always... She's always clawing and hanging in there. And she's becoming, I think, a little more well-rounded. Like, she's, she's still getting better. And she's not even, like, old, really. Like, she's like 30, 31? Uh, I think she's older than that. Is she? I think. Uh, she's still got some, some years left. Uh, No, she's 31, but she's also been fighting since, like, 2010. So she's got, like, a decade on her. Yeah, she's got a little, yeah, she's got a little, little mileage, but... She could still make another run. If, you know, depending matchups and so on and so forth. But she's still out here. She's still really good. I mean, arguably, like, the only two people she's lost to are Joanna and Jacek and Tatiana Suarez. Like, yeah, the Marcos fight was a split. The Gadella fight, I thought she won. Like, so. Yeah, she, she's still really good. Yeah. She, she's still really good. But, hey, man. I, I got, I got to give props to Esparza. And, and I don't want to deter listeners. Like, it was a really good fight. 
it was a it was an awesome fight. But it's just if if looking at it from a fan's perspective, if you're a Grasso fan, it was just extremely frustrating. Like you saw some good things, and then you saw some other things that were just like, oh, like you yeah, that was that was that was no bueno, no bueno. But awesome fight from both. Still great, great, great performance from uh, Esparza. Uh, Grasso, man, just next time you go for the kill, you gotta, you gotta go for the kill. Like, N- yeah, like, come on. Yeah, you gotta go for it. You gotta. Got like, got some awareness. Yeah, yeah. But it was still an awesome fight. Just from a fan standpoint, like I said, just it hurt. <laughs> Blood pressure was was through the roof watching that fight. Um, but Sparza won a majority decision. Uh, moving on to flyweight, a fight, another fight I was really looking forward to, um, and it, it delivered. And then the judges came in. <laughs> Something else happened, but uh, Brandon Moreno versus Askar uh, Askarov. Uh, Asgar came into this fight undefeated. Was he nine and oh, ten and oh? Uh, it was ten and oh, ten and oh. So, or, prospect, yeah, on the rise. Brandon Moreno, we know he's been out here, made his way back to the UFC. Um, but <laughs> another fight that was really awesome, and then the end happened, and then scorecards got read. But it this was a really dope fight, though. Like, this was a really fun, you know. Flyweights once again, just kind of showing out. Um, <laughs> it was a really just wild kind of, um, you know, great, obviously great grappling from Askarov. Um, able to uh, get Moreno down, I'm pretty sure that was in the first. Uh, got Moreno down, I think got his back a couple times. Uh, was able to con- control him a bit. Um, and then... <laughs> But Moreno just he would have these just kind of every now and again he just had this random spurt of violence that just kind of you know it's a Moreno fight you know there, there has to be some kind of violence um I can't remember if the head kick no that was the second round or was that the first that was second okay that was the second but then did he rock him at the end of the first two oh uh, yeah well he rocked him yeah. basically every round yeah he uh, like he would just have these spurts of violence where he like in terms of damage moreno definitely did more damage because every like little violent spat he had like he would get askarov hurt um regardless like of how the fight was going prior to it like askarov would spend a lot of the fight like he's getting a you know winning a lot of the grappling exchanges and moreno was having to get his way out of like these bad spots and then they start trading, and he'd, like, rock Askarov, and then it goes back to the grappling. It was it was a wild, like, really back and forth, and then he uh, caught Askarov with that head kick in the second <clears> round, <throat> and then they, they end the second round with Moreno for, like, 15 seconds. They're in, like, the reverse triangle position, and they're just sitting there, and I think they both just kind of agree, like, bro, we've been fighting really hard, and we're both tired. Just going to chill out for these last 15 and just kind of sit here. Yeah. Yeah, I wasn't mad at it, though, because up to that point, they were putting on... It was a great fight. Like, they were really just going back and forth. Both guys really just kind of going for it. Um, but that third round, man, I've never been so proud to be a fan of somebody. <laughs> <laughs> that third round, that third round, man, I've I've never been so happy before. Like, it, I, and I think it was really gutsy, because obviously against Askarov, like, you don't... You don't want to get in too many grappling exchanges because it might not it might not go your way. And we saw like Askarov was having success grappling. He couldn't you know finish the fight, but he was able to get Moreno down. He was able to control him. Like he's really active on the ground. So not where you really want to be if you can help it. Third round comes. Moreno says, "You know what? It's whatever. Thug life." Goes for a takedown. Not only does he get the takedown. But, like, he spent most of that round either on top or, like, winning the grappling exchange. Like, got him down, landed some, some ground and pound. At one point, he had Askarov back. Uh, he tried to sink in a choke, but he couldn't get it. And I, I thought it was really just ballsy. Like, I wasn't expecting him to just shoot for a takedown in the third round. 
and he went for it and got it and actually like really legit made it work that entire round. And I I was just like, bro, you you you're the man for that. Cuz I didn't I didn't see that coming. I didn't think he was going to go for it and he went for it and not only did he went for it but like it worked. And he almost almost got a finish out of it. And I was like, bro, bro this is why I love watching this guy fight. <laughs> like <laughs> this is exactly why I'm a fan of this guy. It, that fight was so good. Uh but then it ended in a draw. Um 28, with Wiki, if these cards are right, 28, 28, 28, 29, 30, 27. A draw split. Yeah. Um, it is what it is, I guess. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was one of those fights, I guess, where do you weigh out damage over control, I guess. But even then, like, Moreno had control for more of the fight. Yeah, and definitely like he had most of the damage, not probably all of it. Not to say Asquad didn't land anything, but all of the significant damage definitely came from Moreno. Yeah, um, I scored it for Moreno in real time, so I wasn't thrilled with the draw. But I, I guess because it was such a good fight, I was like. I, I guess this is cool, but not really. <laughs> but I don't know. What 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 were your thoughts? Um, Askarov fights like a dude who who fights at like welterweight, and Brandon Moreno is like the quintessential flyweight fighter, where he doesn't really have a defined style. He's just super athletic and can do a little bit of everything. And while he's not, like, the most technical dude, he just seems to have an understanding of, like, uh, if I clear my hips, I'll be able to explode back to my feet. So I'm going to just do that now. So it makes for a very fun, wild matchup where Askarov tries to suplex Moreno, and Moreno's just able to, like, somersault his way out of it. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. That, that was neat. It was, it was a great fight. Um why the UFC wanted to get rid of this division is still far beyond me. Um, mind you, they cut one of the dudes who... who the, the main dude who was the reason this fight was so fucking entertaining, Brandon Moreno. Um, yeah, like... <clears throat> I, I'm, hes- I'm really hesitant to call Moreno like a better striker than Askarov, though he did have like moments of like clarity and was like, Wow, this technique works. So I'm gonna just keep going back to it. Like, there's a moment in like I think it was the second round, where um, Moreno throws like the same uppercut slash hook to the body, right hand upstairs, three times in a row, and every single time it landed, clean. But like, at the same time, he's throwing like a lot of winging hooks and these big flashy uppercuts with no setup. And they kind of work just because he's so freaking fast. On the other side, like, you can tell Askarov's a dude who's just used to being able to push dudes around on the ground. Um, he's, I, I guess he's just not used to, like, the level of, like, athletic freak that Moreno is. Um, and it made for, like, a great, interesting matchup. Um, I, I don't know if they run this one back, but I think they probably should because, I mean, the first one was this one. So. Um, good on Moreno for learning to take dudes down um just or i'm sorry having the presence of mind to realize that he should take down askarov because Askarov's probably not used to being on his back um you know great fight i'm i'm not gonna say i'm surprised anyone fight the night but it, it was a really good fight so hats off to both men Oh, I was just gonna say who got fight tonight. It was the Sparza and uh, it was the Sparza and Grasso. Then Grasso. Yeah, I'm, I'm not mad at that because, like I said, if I remove my fan feelings, <laughs> that was a that was a great fight. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I can't be mad at that. But yeah, if if it weren't for that fight, yeah, Moreno Mar- and Askarov definitely would have got fight tonight. Um, but great performance from bro uh, from both fighters. I wouldn't mind seeing them run this back, but fortunately it ended in a, a split draw. Is what it is, but uh, long live flyweight. That's that's all in that. Uh, I'll let you kick off this next one. 
Uh, what's the next one? Oh, oh, right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Irene Aldana. Um, she was originally supposed to fight Marion Renault on this card, uh, but Renault pulled out um, a week or two ago. So we ended up with a short, no- uh, short notice replacement in Vanessa Mello, who is a where she fight out of? Oh, uh, a gold team member in Sao Paulo. Um, this was an Alrene Aldana fight. It was a fun action fight in which she got off to an early lead, and it looked like she was going to bulldoze her opponent. But either. Um, but I'm sorry. Sometime in the second round, Melo got Aldana's timing down, um, as everybody who seems to fight Aldana does eventually, um, and just started connecting and made it into more of a fight than it probably had any right to be. Um, yeah. So, I'll, but Aldana was able to walk over with the uh, unanimous, the unanimous decision win. So, I guess it all worked out in the end. Um, uh, watch her have done a fight, man. It's so like it. What's with Aldana and Grasso? Because, like, um. <laughs> there are obvious holes in Aldana's game, but like, it feels like she should, like, even with them, she should be so much better than she actually is. Like, the parts of her game are better than the sum of them. If that makes any sense. Um, super good with the one two. Su- like she moves moderately well. She moves uh, like uh, she rarely gets caught in one place. But like it, it, it feels like there are points in the fight where she just realizes, or she just does something that just makes you scratch her head. And. They're in between these moments of, like, technical brilliance. And it's so disheartening, because, like, Aldana should have beat Raquel Pennington. And she should have probably knocked out Melo here. Or at least took in a far wider decision. But she, like, I don't know if it's because, like, she only fights at the one pace and, like, eventually people are just able to time her or she slows down or her movement becomes too predictable because she likes to really circle to the power side of her opponent. But, like, it just feels after, like, a certain point, people, like, realize what's up and they're just able to fight with her. Yeah, I, I didn't know if it was Mellow just being, like, tough. Because, boy, did she eat a lot of shots. Like, a lot. <laughs> Probably an absurd amount. Um... But I just remember thinking during this fight, like, man, if Aldana would be deadly if she had, like, some KO power. Or just, like... That's the thing, though. She does. It's just that, like... It's super... Or if she just... She, she's not... Obviously, she's not, like, um... I, I, I don't know. Uh, like, Dua Choi, for example, who has, like, legit one punch, you're out, knockout power. But, like... I, I think a lot of it's just, like, People see the punches coming. She only fights, like I said, she only fights at one speed, and she only fights really like straight in front of her opponent. She's not really somebody who's going to cut an angle and try to surprise you with a punch. You know what I mean? Yeah, I I, I thought, and it, it it's almost really hard to critique this fight because she 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 was working out there, but it just felt like a fight where I guess she could have gotten a finish, but like. I guess outside of that, though, I, I did thoroughly enjoy watching this fight. Like, she she is good together at putting combinations. I like how well she mixes it up. She'll, she can throw a one-two. She'll hit you to the body. Like, she threw everything at Vanessa. Like, she was tagging her every which way. I can't remember what round. might have been second or third. She caught her with a really nice head kick. Like, she can mix it up really, really well, like, when she's in her zone. And I felt like we saw a small... It was a brief glimpse of kind of what I would like to see from her more. And it was right at the end of the first round where I felt like those last like 15 seconds, she hit like ultra instinct. And like It seemed like she really started going in and she was throwing like Superman punches. And I was like, all right, you're trying to get her out of here. 
but it was for just that small moment. And then, like, it stopped. Because, like, she threw, like, a flying knee at the end of the first round. Like, a jumping knee. And then, like, it just ended. And I was like, I feel like if you would have had more moments where you just... And you don't even really have to go berserk. Because she lands at a pretty decent volume. It's like, if you just put your foot on the gas just a little bit more, you probably could have got a stoppage. Or at least, like, rocked her hard a couple times, you know. Had her, like, backpedaling and then trying to... Trying to get away. <laughs> was that Moreno? I don't even mean to backtrack. Wasn't that the Moreno fight where, like, he literally did a full run around the cage and then shrugged his arms? <laughs> when, like, I think Askarov was going for a takedown. I think that happened in that fight. But, um... I mean, it wasn't a bad performance. It's just, like... No, nah, it was a fighting it was really on short notice. You're a top 10 like fighter in the division. Like... It really feels like you should, at the very least, be beating them more one-sidedly than you did. Uh, I guess it is what it is. But it, it was still, I still thoroughly enjoyed watching it. Uh, she was the sole bright spot on the on the main card in terms of wins yeah. for uh, the home Mexico. crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because like I said, when, when she can put them hands together, like she throws really good combinations and mixes it up really well. But like you said, she does... She does, I, I never really noticed that until you pointed out. She does kind of fight, like, at one speed. Like, she never accelerates or slows down. It's just kind of this one, I'm going to stay in my lane, this one lane, and I'm just going to kind of operate here. And it'll either get me the win or it won't. Um, but I don't know. I, I still enjoy watching her fight. It's just, you, you know, like, if she ever finds herself against, you know, like champion caliber opponents, then you're gonna you're gonna need that extra gear. That's that's gonna have to be there, um, for you to get those kind of wins. Um, I mean, it was what it was though. She, for all intents and purposes, um, she boxed Mello up. Uh, she she boxed her up for three rounds. You just wish you could have got kind of got a finish out of it, but. Either way, though, it was still a really, really great performance, and I'm always down for an Aldana fight. Um, so I'm, I'm always looking forward to what she does next. So she got the unanimous decision win. Scorecards were pretty lopsided, <laughs> as they should have been. Um, so congrats to Aldana. And rounding out the main card, boy, oh, boy, Steven Peterson versus Martin Bravo at Featherweight. You want to talk about uh, unfortunate endings. Um Man. <laughs> um I mean Martin Bravo, I, man. He 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 feel like he's a very skilled fighter from what I remember seeing of him previously and from seeing him fight Peterson here, but good God. Laps and I don't know if, I don't even know if you can call it judgment, to be honest with you. Yeah, I don't I I wouldn't say it was a lapse in judgment, it was just I think it was, this was like one of those fights where everything was just going well until it wasn't. And I think I think he was like in a rhythm, like he was feeling really good about himself. And he just kind of cuz I I really can't fault I'm going to say I can't. I can't really fault him cuz you don't really expect, you know. <laughs> just oh, just for our context, to start from the beginning. Dudes come out from the beginning. You already know what's going down. We're, they're throwing hands in, uh, instantly. We're not. They're, they're not waiting. There's no fill out process. So they come out. Peterson and Martin Bravo. They're 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 throwing down, pretty much instantly. And then once the fight like, kind of sort of I guess settled in for lack of a better term, um, like it was a good back and forth. But it, to me, it felt like Bravo was the better out of the two in terms of like kind of putting it all together. I like the body work that he was doing, and he was staying pretty consistent with it. Um, it just seemed like he was putting it together a, a, a little bit better than than Peterson. And I think he found himself just kind of in a groove to where, like, it, it seemed like everything was just working really well. Um, and he started off the second round, I want to say, pretty much the same. Like, he pretty much carried on that momentum from the first. He had a lot of good things going, still landing, uh, landing a lot of good shots, mixing it up to the head and the body, and then he had that body kick that he was throwing to the midsection. He 
had a lot of things really working in his favor. Um, then he he landed a couple takedowns too, right? I can't remember if I'm thinking of this or if I'm confusing him with another fight. Bravo, he landed one in the first. Yeah. So like he had a good mix of things going on for him. And in the midst of, you know, a, a really fun, entertaining back and forth, but a fight that I'm pretty sure Bravo was probably winning, you know, goes for a spinning back fist, gets countered <laughs> with a spinning back fist from Peterson, and the lights shut off, the show is over. Mm. Instantly. Mm. Didn't even, didn't need the follow-up punch. He was, he, as soon as the spinning back fist connected, he was dead. It was over. Um, yeah, things were going well, and so they weren't going well. Yeah. I mean, Peterson, by the end of the first round, seemed to have, like, found his groove a little bit and was fighting his way, his way back in the fight. Um, I think the pace was just too much for Bravo to keep up. Like, he, he looked tired after, the fir- uh, after, like, the first four minutes of the fight. Like, not enough that where you're like, oh, he's gassed, but, like, his style is based around standing directly in front of the guy he's fighting. Um, and just, like, keeping... Like, he, he doesn't throw in volume, but he throws at, like, a high rate. So he'll he'll right. do, like, a 2-3 punch uh, strike combination. And then immediately go to the next 2-3 punch combination. Um, and, there, and there is a little bit of, like, movement in there. Like, he hit a nice... Um, yeah, a couple of like really nice like as Peterson came forward, he um, pivoted off and hit him with like a nice two punch combo to the body. But like a lot of his game is literally just standing at the end of not even at the end, like in the middle of striking range and just throwing more than his opponent. And that requires a lot of energy. Um. Like good, good on Peterson, and props to Fortis MMA for picking up another win. Like they're on a hell of a run right now. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, I feel bad for Bravo. He's better than his like one in three record in the UFC. But like, I, I think it's just an approach thing for him at this point, where it's like, okay, once people see what I have to offer. Or what he has to offer, um, they're they're better able to adjust to what he does because there's so little, I guess, variation. So, uh, props to Peterson. Yeah, fighting is all about moments, mm-hmm. taking advantage. It it only takes a split second. For things to go extremely right for one person and the complete opposite for the other. And, uh, yeah. Steven Peterson uh, throws his uh, uh, hat in the ring for a KO of the Year candidate <laughs> well, with this one. So, um, what a way to kick off a main card. <laughs> like, what a way to kick off a main card. But, yeah, great, great win for Peterson. That was, a, like I said, probably one of the craziest KOs you'll see all year. Um, I just feel really bad for Bravo. Like, man, I thought you looked really great. And then life just kind of happened. But it is what it is. That was the main card of UFC Mexico City. Uh, So we can move on to the preliminary portion of the card. Um, I'll throw out a disclaimer. Um, When I came back, I came back from Delaware as the prelims, well, the prelims had already kicked off. I came in during the Betch, Kohei, and uh, Tajar Eubanks fight. Um, but I was really tired after my little Delaware trip. I was tired of driving, and I had some Chinese food, so my, my belly was full. So I was fading in and out of these prelims. Um, I rewatched some of them this morning, but my memory might be a little hazy on some of these fights. But starting from the top, prelim headliner was Jose Alberto Quiones versus Carlos watching if I'm saying that correctly um I didn't get a chance to rewatch this one but all I remember from this fight is man Kionis just I feel like he can just kind of do what he wants and uh whatever he does is gonna work <laughs> like if I want to stand and strike I can stand and strike I'll take you down I can take you down yeah 
whatever strike I want to throw on the feet, I'm going to throw it, and it's going to connect, and it's going to work, and there's not really much you can do about it, and I'm going to dance around, and I'm just going to have a, I'm going to have a good old time in here, and that's what he did for three rounds. <laughs> it reminded me of the, um, maybe on a lesser scale, of the fight from the, uh, the, the, the China card, the, uh, oh. the guy's name. I, oh, uh, M- Muda Jiri? Yeah. Yeah, it reminded me of that, kind of a lesser scale. It wasn't as much of a slacking, but it just kind of reminded me in that similar fashion that I'm just going to kind of do what I want, and it's going to work. And that's kind of what I got out of this fight. I have no idea why, but, like, Quinones looked like a whole division bigger than, uh, what's the dude's name? Uh, Huachin? Huachin? Huachin. Carlos. Carlos. He looked a whole division bigger than Carlos. Apparently, they're only like an inch apart in height, though, so go figure. Really? Yeah. I feel like Kionis was a lot taller than him. Maybe, it's just, maybe Kionis just like stands up a lot. Or... Yeah, could, yeah, could be just a stand. But, he seemed like he was taller. Yeah, no, this looked like a, a big brother just like beating up on his little brother. Like, there, yeah. there's, there's not a whole lot to add beyond that. Like, I mean, was this the fight? Or was no, that was the playest fight. Um, yeah, no, that is yeah, it, it was what it was, you know. Like, I, I don't got a whole lot to add because yeah. I, I didn't pay particularly close attention. Um, but Keonis looked like the more experienced dude just being up on the less experienced dude. If this was a video game equivalent, it's when you're in the training mode and you're going through the move list. And like the uh, AI doesn't fight back. Uh, it's kind of what this. <laughs> that's, that's what I got from that fight. Mm-hmm. Um, great win for Kionis, man. He went out there and just kind of showed out for three rounds. So um, good on him. Great performance. He got a pretty lopsided unanimous decision win. Uh, moving down to featherweight. Boy, oh boy. Mm-hmm. Kyle Nelson versus Marco Polo Reyes. Um, you know, at first I want to say, <clears throat> before we get to the fight, which didn't last, uh, that long, a little over a minute, um, to fighters, uh, dropping weight classes, um, I'm gonna need y'all to stop thinking that just because you go down a weight class that it's about to be sweet, like, that you're just gonna go down a weight class and kind of just have your way with people. Um, I feel like back in the day, I ain't gonna say that was the case, but you probably could have got away with it more because divisions weren't as deep as they are now and the talent wasn't as rich as it is now. But, uh, in 2019, this whole, I'm gonna just go down a weight class and it's gonna get easier for me. That's not a thing anymore, bro. Like, yeah, no, it really those little, yeah, those advantages that you thought you were gonna have. You might get them depending on who you're matched up with. And that's only because I feel like every division has that one guy who's kind of stuck in that division and he can't go up or down because he's he's not big enough to go up and he's too small to go down. So he's like stuck in purgatory. <laughs> like there, There's like almost that one guy in every division. But unless you're fighting that one guy, your those advantages don't exist anymore. Like that's that's not a thing anymore. And even if you are bigger, everybody's so skilled now that it it, it evens out. Like, even if you are bigger, dudes are just as skilled as people above or below them. So it's like, these little perceived advantages, they don't they don't work. It's, it's not a thing anymore. Uh, and poor Polo, I felt really bad for him, man. I, I was looking forward to this fight. You know, I was like, it's Marco Polo Reyes. It's going to be a nice, fun, violent time. And it was violent. It's just, he was on the receiving end of it. Uh, <laughs> come out. He looks pretty good in the beginning for all of, like, 15 seconds. Uh, he came out, threw some hands a little bit. I think he landed like a little, little leg kick, threw a leg kick. Um, and then he throws a kick, gets his foot caught, gets pushed against the cage. They clinch for a little bit. And then he gets Kyle Nelson just unleashes on him. Um, I think it was a elbow that kicked it off. <coughs> and then he ate a right hand that... Was his eye bloody before that right-handed? Or did that right hand just splat blood out of nowhere? I think, was it the elbow? 
No, no. Because I swear, I swear I didn't see the blood until that right hand landed and then blood just magically appeared on this man's eye. <laughs> like, it could have been the elbow. I don't know. It might have been the elbow. Because that elbow was kind of vicious. Oh, let me, let me, but, let me see if I can find a video of the, uh, the thing. But continue. But yeah, like, he elbows him, lands the right hand, I see blood splatter, and then Kyle Nelson just kind of starts unloading on him. I think he caught him with a left. And you could tell by, like, the couple of punches he landed after that right hand, Polo was out on his feet. Like, so I saw some people initially mad at the stoppage, but when I saw the replay, I was like, no, bro, he was done. Like, he was literally just standing up, kind of just, his hands were up, but he wasn't there. Like, if there was no fence, I think he probably would have just either fell backwards or just, like, sunk to the floor. Like, the man, I, it's weird. It's weird, weird seeing somebody being out on their feet. Because to me, he clearly, during that replay, he was not there. Yeah, no. After that right hand landed, he was there. I was one of those people who was like, wow, they really stopped there early. And then I got to look at the replay. I didn't realize how fucking hard that right hand landed. I think you're right. The blood came from the right hand. Um, but, yeah, no, that, that, he, he was out from the first punch. Like, when he was covered, he was already out at that point. Like, he was gone. Yeah. And he wasn't even trying to, like, move his head or even tie up. Like, he was just, he was a sitting. No, that, that, that was, was pure instinct. The, the double arm, uh, for, uh, the double arms up, foreguard, whatever. Right. Uh, he, he was done. Fun dropping the featherweight. <laughs> so, uh, I feel I, I feel bad for him, man. Like, he started his career off so strong, and like he fought Demir Hadzovic, and it's just been hell ever since. Yeah, that, that, that's why. Like, <laughs> I posted on Twitter after this fight was over. I was like, I you know I had to give myself the men in black flash after this fight was over. He's like, man, I didn't want to see him get done like that. Like. I was expecting him to have a nice, violent performance, and we get a nice... I mean, it was a great finish, but it was like, man. From a fan standpoint, it was like, God, he he, he got dogged. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yep. I don't... And it's not like Kyle Nelson's like Drew Dober or Demir or James Vick, who are the, like, the last three people to knock him out. Um, mostly... Excuse me. Mostly a grapple here, right? If I'm remembering correctly, um, so that, that's not a good look for your uh, move to featherweight. If that's the dude who's putting you up against the, uh, putting you out against the fence, um, sad, sad times. Yeah, yeah, but you know, it's MMA. Somebody's got to get sacrificed to the gods and. Just it be like that sometimes. But props to Kyle uh, Nelson. He went for the kill and he got it uh, really early in the fight. So he got a first round TKO. So congrats to Kyle Nelson. Uh, moving down to women's straw weight. Angela Hill versus Arian Carnalossi. Carnalossi. I'm saying that correct. Um, boy, just looking at the physique. Um, I was like, yeah, Carnalossi. Because she missed weight, right? Carnalossi? Did no, she. I thought somebody missed no, weight. she came in at 112 pounds. What? Yeah, that's what the thing said. Well, she weighed like 130 during this. Yeah, fight. she is so, uh, ripped, bro. I saw them, them back muscles. <laughs> like <laughs> them back muscles. I was like, bro, she looks like she could just toss you across the room. There's probably not a lot you can do about. I, I just like she's only like five two. That's another thing. That's a whole side note. I don't know why I'm always dumbfounded when, like, they show a fighter's height on the screen. And I'm always, like, confused at how short they are compared to, like, the image I have of them in my head. Not that I think, like, every fighter's some seven-foot giant. But, like, <laughs> like when they're reading the, the, the card for Esparza Grasso and, like, you, you see the little graphic and Esparza 5-1... And I'm trying to imagine a 5'1 person just kind of, like, doing what she does. 
I'm like, <laughs> this is crazy. Like, <laughs> like my mom's like five five. So I'm like, this person is a whole four inch shorter than my mom, and she's out here wrestling and beating people up. Like this, <laughs> this is wild. But um, yeah, the height thing always throws me off. But Angela Hill versus uh, Arian Kondalasi. Um, I wasn't familiar with Arian, but based off of like the physique, I was like, you know what, this fight is probably gonna go two ways. Um, Arian's either gonna overpower her because she looks like she could lift up a tank, and I'm hoping with you know if you're built like that, you should probably hit pretty hard. So I'm like, she's either gonna be able to crack Angela really hard or kind of bully her around physically. Or Angela Hill is just going to be way too slick uh, and kind of be able to find her way in and out. And also with those uh, huge back muscles, <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know how her cardio is going to be. Um, like if she'll be able to keep a pace for, for three rounds. And I think the fight, even without knowing much about Arian, I was like, I think this fight pretty much went the way I thought it would. Like Angela Hill is really slick on the feet, um, doesn't have, like, a lot of power, but throws a pretty decent volume, does a great job of mixing it up, it's really good at just kind of sticking and moving, um, and I mean, as long as you, as long as she can stay off of her back, like, she's gonna give you a fight, if you can't get on her back, you know, she's really proficient on her feet, and if anything, the fight that she had against Andrade, which is crazy, which I think is one of her best performances, even though it was a losing effort, she told she showed that she can take a punch. And I'm like, if she can survive hits from Andrade and survive, then I don't see why she can't survive uh uh hits against Arian. So a uh, really good performance. I was really happy to see Angela Hill. I think that well, I think Arian was a replacement, I feel like. I thought Hill was fighting somebody. Um let me check. Cause I I was it, it feels like this was like a last minute type deal. Yeah. I don't think this was Ah, she was the... supposed to fight Estella Nunes. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I figured this was a replacement. Yeah, um, yeah, like it, it was cool to see Hill fight somebody who's not like, j like we're sitting here talking about Carnalasi being like a tank, but like it was cool to see somebody who just could not outmuscle her around. You're right. Um, which is kind of what we're used to seeing a little bit, but um, when given somebody like around her size, like she is really good, like. We saw her drop um, Jessica Andrade in the clinch, and like she lit Ariane Carnalosi up real nice in the clinch with the elbows. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the one that eventually stopped the fight uh, by having a cut right over the eye. Um, the knees, especially in that first round, she was going to town on Carnalosi's body with those knees. Um, and she was just too quick for her. Um, un unlike uh, Jessica Andrade, who basically through any time Angela Hill stopped moving, Karnalasi was a little bit more judicious with her attacks. Uh, she was equally aggressive, but did not have the volume to back it up. Right. Um, and, and Hill's a, just a tough fighter regardless. Even if you hit her clean, she's not going to back down and um, not going to go down off of one punch alone. So it, it was a pretty good performance for Angela Hill. Yeah, I feel like Hill is, like, deceptively, like, tough. Like, you kind of look at her frame and figure, like, yeah, hey, I catch her one clean time, she's probably out of here. Yeah, no, she is. But, nah, she's, nah. She doesn't really get finished that often. She went, um, no, she does not, uh, she's only been stopped by, like, submission. Yeah, like, she's never been, like, clean cut, you know, tapped on the chin and going to sleep. Like, that doesn't happen. Right, um, yeah, dude, if there was a... Uh, Adam Wade division, she'd be, she'd probably find her, like, center, you know what I mean, in terms of, like, just right. going back and forth with her record, but, um, yeah, no, good win for Hill, not a bad debut for Kanalasi, um, especially on short notice, curious how she does, so, I, I have, I didn't looked into her, like, back, uh, log of fights, like, her biography, but, you're coming in at 112 pounds, kind of tells me that uh, you might be an atom weight. Or, you, like, you probably didn't cut weight to make weight this time around. 
Uh, either that or you just had like a really irresponsible weight cut. All right. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited to see her fight again. Like I'm, I'm all for pressure fighters. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. And eventually you'll maybe go against somebody who can bully around. We'll see how that looks. <laughs> we'll find somebody you can get a hold of, and then we can see what she can really do. But uh, nah, man, love love Angela Hill. Great win. Just really slick on the feet. Just sticking and moving knees. Elbow. That finishing elbow was beautiful. And it was like a one-shot elbow, too. Like, just perfectly placed. Yeah, just, just good stuff. Good stuff from Angela Hill, man. Um, so, congrats to her. She actually got the win via doctor stoppage. Uh, as the Antaku mentioned, opened a pretty nasty cut over her eye. That was such a perfectly placed elbow. Like, the cut was like... That her face looked like a movie poster, where like the blood is like right above and below the eye. Yeah, like, <laughs> like, that elbow was like perfectly placed. Um, no, great, great win for Angela Hillman. That was an awesome performance. So, congrats to her. I uh, got the key TKO TKO stoppage. Uh, moving to flyweight, Sergio Pettis versus Tyson Nam. Um, I was really looking forward to the fight. Wanted to see how Nam would do, since he's finally in the UFC. Uh, you know, it was, it was a fight. It was cool. <laughs> it was, I wasn't really thrilled one way or another. Um, like, it was a good performance from Pettis. Like, pretty much a lot of his fight was contested on the feet. Uh, Pettis with pretty decent boxing. Like, good, good at the, the fundamentals. Not, not flashy as is uh his older brother he he's more of the the fundamentalist i guess i would say but like he, he pretty much just was able to outbox nam for three rounds nam tried to walk for it and get things going but could never really find a consistent groove um, i mean this was basically the the same as the hill kind of Aussie fight with, yeah, with the, yeah. the more aggressive fighter coming forward and just walking onto punches. Like, N- Nam has, like, moments of success. But, like, he has, like, Sean Porter syndrome where he'll crowd his own punches as he's trying to, like, close the distance. It's really weird. It's like, hey, if you were... If, if you picked your shot there a little bit better, you probably could have punched... Sergio Pettis, like, underneath his elbow, got him to the body. But, like, you were like, I have to punch him to the head, so I'm going to throw these looping punches around his head and not hit anything. Uh, it was weird. Yeah, I don't have a ton to... It was, it was kind of a Pettis fight. Like, in, in Sergio Pettis fights, like, I feel like he's one of those guys that just kind of takes what you give him. Sergio Pettis has all the tools his brother doesn't and it shows as to why Anthony Pettis is out here having action fights and he doesn't. (laughs) But it's weird because like fundamentally I think Sergio's more sound in terms of like being disciplined but it's almost like he's too I don't say too disciplined but he really is like the polar opposite of Anthony. Like, Anthony's like, yo, I'm, I'm about the action, want to lose, I'm trying to put on the highlight, and, like, Sergio's, like, the little Tim Duncan. Like, yeah, I'm just, I can't even say that. At least Tim Duncan got the backboard shot. Like, not the flashiest thing, but it was cool to look at. And Sergio's just like, I, I just kind of take what you give me. And if it's working, I'm just going to let it keep working. Um... And he, he and I don't really want to downplay. Like he, he looked good. Like he pretty much just outboxed Nam for three rounds, and there weren't really too many moments where he was ever in like any real danger. But I don't know. For some reason, from Sergio, I'm just I'm I'm all, <laughs> and it's probably not gonna happen. I, I probably it's my fault, I guess, for maybe expecting this from him because he hasn't shown me otherwise. I guess I'm just waiting for, like, a switch to flick or something. Like, yeah. Like, and it's just, I don't think that's, that just might not be who he is. Like, that just might. And it's not that he's, he's not a bad fighter at all. Like, he's really talented. It's just, I'm, 
I guess I'm just waiting for something else, and I don't think that something else is him. Like, he just, he might not have that. Like, this just might just be who he is. I'm going to fight at one pace. I'm, I'm really solid fundamentally, and if what I'm doing is working, I'm just going to do it for as long as I can, as long as it wins me to fight. Not going to turn it up. Not going to do anything too crazy. I think he threw like a, he threw, he threw like a spinning kick out there, tried to mix it up. Um, did he do like a capoeira kick too? I'm uh, pretty sure that was Yeah, it. I think he did one. Yeah, he tried like one. Ended up on his back, I think. But, you know, I applaud the effort. I was, I was glad to see that. Like, all right, there you go. That's a little, little Pettis blood. But, you know, he just kind of goes out there and just kind of just does his thing for three rounds. And it either works or it doesn't. But good win for him. Uh, for Nam, you know, I wanted him to get the W. Like you said, he had little moments, but not 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 enough uh, substance, I guess. But, uh, yeah. That was Sergio Pettis and Tyson. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, that was probably, uh, like, besides the players, it was probably the least interesting fight on the card. Which sucks, because I like both guys, but... Yeah, you just kind of want to see. Like, I mean, like the first ten fights of his career, which we all followed because he had the name Pettis attached to him, like on the regional circuit, he was out here finishing dudes. And when he got to the UFC and got caught a couple of times, it was like, oh, okay, I have to take fewer risks to 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 sustain myself. You know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is what it is. But still a good, good performance from, uh, from Sergio. Moving on to the uh, only pair of 205ers uh, on the card. Paul Craig versus Vinicius Moreira. Um, I don't know why I had this thought, but... And I'm not going to go through the whole fight, because it, it didn't really last that long anyway, but I'm just going to kind of fast forward a little bit. But the second that uh, I think they were against the cage and Morera pulled guard, I just had this feeling like this is going to go wrong. I feel it. Something's going to happen, and this is not going to be the way to go. It's not going to go the way Venetia thinks it's going to go. Um, and it didn't. <laughs> um, he pulled guard, tangled on the ground for a minute. Um, I honestly don't remember... I don't remember the moments right before the finish. All I remember is Vinicius was trying to stand up, and boy, Paul Craig had him sized up. Like, boy, as soon as you lift your hands off the ground, you are about to get it. And the second Vinicius got his hands off the ground, Paul Craig kneed him, I think, twice, mm -hmm. um, dropped him, and then proceeded to just beat the life out of this man. I, I'm going to disagree with you there. He missed every single one of them ground and ground shots. He got a couple of. <laughs> he got a couple of. He no, was whiffing that air. I, I I think he hit a shoulder. <laughs> he got a couple to the chin. At least one or two of them landed. I blocked. He tried. <laughs> I had to see the replay. I only I only watched this fight once. <laughs> but, you know, either way, the, the knees definitely did the damage. Like Morel was kind of curled up. Just kind of. Whether Paul Craig was eating shot, whether uh, Paul Craig was swinging that air or not, uh, it looked as if Moreira was curled up. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't want any more smoke. And then uh, Paul Craig just sinks in the uh, rear naked choke, and uh, game over. That is it. Is that a, is Paul Craig on a win streak? Uh, I want to say this is the second one in a row. I think he lost to Jimmy Crew. Uh, he lost to Alonzo Menafield. That's what it was. Oh, okay. So he's he's, he, he's win loss win loss so far. Yeah. And is Vinicius a tough guy? Uh, I want to say he was on tough Brazil. No, he was a Dana White contender series guy. Hmm. But he is now zero and three in the UFC. Yeah, and it's uh. No bueno. Is he the dude who beat? No, he's not. Okay. Albeit, it, well, you know what? No, never mind. I was going to try to shoot him some bill. <laughs> but, yeah. 0-3. Not, uh, 
not the best of look. Probably won't uh, be seeing him in the UFC for a while. I mean, by heavyweight, bro. Bodies are bodies. That is true. That is true. That is true. But, uh... Well, I don't remember if I asked you if you had any thoughts other than Craig swinging at, uh... <laughs> yeah. Nah, good, for, uh, good one for Paul Craig. Just that, that's basically it. Um, yeah. Light heavyweight is just such a weird division. Like, because this used to be the division where, like, guys, like, stopped, like, where the athletic bar used to be. Where, like, you could have a Rashad Evans or Leo Machida and they're, like, super athletic. And then, like, you go up any bigger than the guys are just, like, awkwardly falling over their own feet. <laughs> but now it kind of feels like it's that. It, it, it is that division. We're like it is. <laughs> if it like, uh, they mentioned this on the Heavy Hands podcast this week because I think some. Uh, I think they were talking about the Glover fight where like Glover was on Nikita Krylov's back, and Nikita Krylov tripoded up to get out. And it's, and if this was happening at like lightweight, what would happen is the guy on top would like let go. And like crawl his way off of the guy's back and like maybe step over him so that he wouldn't like just fall over and land on his back. But here's Glover Teixeira, like an accomplished jujitsu fighter in his own, like outside of MMA. And he just kind of falls over. <laughs> it's that division. Hey, hey, man, he's like 40 years old. <laughs> and he's still a top five fighter. <laughs> Oh man. Oh boy. But uh yeah, that's that's two oh five for you, man. Just shenanigans on shenanigans. But we watch it. It's a thing. But congrats to Paul Craig, got the red naked choke win. Um No, I wanna hear your thoughts on this next fight. Uh, uh, women's band and weight, Batch Kohea. Uh, versus Sajar Eubanks. And this will actually be the last fight that I can comment on because I did not see the uh, very first fight on the card. Um, I liked it. Like, oh my God. Uh, I, I, another fighter I think has become too memefied to actually be looked at critically. That's just an okay fighter. Like, she's super limited. Don't get me wrong. Like, she's not going to, like, she's not like, an all-time great women's fighter, but, like, she knows how to fight. She knows how to protect herself in there. And this is, like, her 10th fight in the UFC, so I'm not surprised that, like, Sajara Eubanks, who, on paper, should have bulldozed Korea, and to an extent did in the first round, where she got her down and just beat the crap out of her. Uh, I'm not surprised that, like, Eubanks kind of just ran out of ideas on the back half of the fight when Correa adjusted. Um, like, really, like, I, I don't know. I'm a, just a sucker for people who go, like, body shots. We, like, you you know this. We all know this. Like, I, if you throw body shots, I'm probably going to rate you way better than you actually are. <laughs> but Betts made it work. Got behind the jab, started throwing those hooks to the body. Then, like after like the the second or third body shot that Betch do, it seemed pretty good that Eubanks just wanted nothing to do with her. Um, in, in the pocket anyway, and like started fighting from the outside. Betch picked up the pressure, started working behind her jab more, putting like these long combinations together and punctuating them with body shots. It was just, it was the crafty veteran taking on the inexperienced um, up and comer who, because of her athleticism and size, has been able to truck everybody else. Um, it, it, I thought it was a fine fight. I was a, uh, I was a little surprised. I ain't gonna, I ain't gonna lie. Um... I was positive Eubanks was going to win this fight. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that was a fair <laughs> assumption. And like in that first round, it looked like it was going to go that way. Uh, right, like she, you know, had the hands going, landed good shots. Um, she landed some really strong ground and pound in that first round, and I was like, all right, this is going the way I kind of thought it would go. She's going to kind of 
she's eventually, I, I was like, she's eventually going to get a stop. It's like, this, her strength is just going to be too much. Like, she's going to, she's eventually going to break Betch at some point. And the first round, it looked like it was going to happen. And then after that, it didn't. Um, and not to say that she didn't, uh, Eubanks didn't have any more moments. But when I realized Betch wasn't going away, and then she started working that body, I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I think uh, I think the fight's slipping, and in the back of my mind, I was like, "Eubanks, please don't, don't, don't give this up." And I mean, Eubanks was out there scrapping; like it, it was a good fight. They were both out there scrapping, but you could just feel the momentum just slowly, just kind of, kind of inching its way over to Betch's side. And I was like, "Oh boy!" And yeah, by that third round, it was like, "Oh man, Betch might actually, uh, she might win this." <laughs> like she might actually win this fight. Um I can't remember the number on the graphic uh when they showed the uh I don't know if it was strikes landed. It had something to do with strikes. But obviously in the first round like Eubanks like was ahead of her by like a mile. And then in the second the gap kinda closed and then by the third, like Betch was just like way ahead. And it just seemed like maybe it was a pace that I don't know if Eubanks could have kept, could keep up with. That, coupled with all the body shots, would probably help empty the gas tank a little earlier. Um, yeah, I, great, great fight from Betch. Like, she survived the storm in that first round, got through, and was able to just gut her way out and take that second and third. And it's got to suck for Eubanks, because it's like, you, you were having, you had moments of success during the fight, but... It just, uh, I don't know, sometimes you need a little more. <laughs> I guess sometimes you just need that extra oomph. And it wasn't for lack of effort. They they were both out there throwing, but that's just, like I said, able to capitalize, work the body. Um, and once she got her volume going and the fight became a little more even, she was just kind of able to gut it out. Um, and she twerked for everybody. <laughs> that's it. Dude, you know what? Do what you gotta do. Stand out. Fuck it. Hey, right. And if you wanna, like, I mean, her have her fun. She just wanna fight. I, I was gonna say, and to be honest, I feel like at this point, I, I'm not gonna say she's like a spectacle, but I do feel like she is like a MMA, like a person that, like, I think, feel like people look at her more of a personality than like a fighter. Like, like I feel like if you read comments about Betch. It's not even about fighting. Like, I don't know. She's one of those fighters, I feel like. Kind of like how you said a while, think, how you think like people don't take her maybe as seriously as they should. I, I don't know. It's, I mean, she was on her but, way to beating Aldana before Aldana got that submission. Yeah. Like, she's not a bad fighter. She's not, like... I think the earlier half of her career... I, I like, think some of the losses that she's had, like, those kind of just stick out in people's heads. Right. And they don't give her any more credit than, oh, Holly Holm nearly killed I her. I mean, that was after three rounds, but that was also after three rounds of, like, I can't even call it competitive, but, like, it's not like Holm, like, was beating the brakes right. off her. The only person to right. do that so far has been Ronda Rousey. Right. But, yeah, I feel like just those two losses just kind of kind of just stick out for people so they they don't really take her that and then you add in the twerking and all that and it's like yeah people don't really take you, it you see her. like the, the stuff that she said about rousey's uh about like rousey like killing herself and like her her begging holly home to hit her before it getting oh, yeah. really knocked <laughs> out almost instantly yeah like that's the type of stuff people remember like yeah yeah you know what i can't even fall <laughs> Yeah, you can't beg to be hit and then get hit and die. Yeah, like, like that, you know what, that I get, but, like, the twerking, like, yeah, her having fun that. and just, like, fucking around in the cage, like, who the fuck cares? Yeah, it is what it like, is, yeah, man. Uh, like, is it any worse than freaking Tito Ortiz's, like, grave digger shit after he laid right. and praise on somebody for, like, three rounds? <laughs> yeah, I am mad at it. Go have your, yeah, go have your fun. I mean, she's out here, she's, she's winning. Uh, in a fight that I think a lot of people... 
like I said, my, my self My favorite part of the whole, my favorite, I'm sorry to cut you off, I just remembered. My favorite part of the whole day is that she started twerking, and then they cut to, like, some random woman with a Brazilian flag in the crowd, and then they come back to her, and then she starts twerking again. <laughs> he said, nah, y'all got done. I'm not done. Y'all gonna see these cheeks. <laughs> Work hard for this. Um, but hey, man. Congrats to Betch. Won a fight that I think a lot of us didn't think she would. Uh, really tough competitor. Like, if you allow her to stay around in the fight, you know, she she might gut one out on you. And you got to go home and look in the mirror and be like, damn, I, I, I'll probably let that one go. But congrats to Betch Cohea. Got the... Uh, Unanimous decision over Sajar Eubanks. Uh, this last fight I can't comment on, but Claudio Puelas got a unanimous decision. Ah, unanimous decision over Marcos Rosa Mariano. It was Puelas out wrestling, out grappling Marcos Mariano for Mar- uh, for three rounds. It wasn't really anything crazy, but the the most interesting part of the fight was um, Mariano. Uh, a Puelas. Puelas got a. He was hunting for that Kimura all fight, but in the third round, he got the Kimura. Uh, well, he got the grip locked in, and Mariano went to go block it by grabbing his own shorts. And then Michael Bisbing was having a freaking meltdown on commentary, saying, that's illegal. You're not allowed to do that. No, you can't. Yeah, no, it's completely illegal. You are 100% <laughs> allowed to grab your own shorts. And um, Brandon Fitzgerald had to, had to nudge him and be like, you're allowed to do that. And Michael Bisbee was like, oh. And he's like, and Fitzgerald was like, it's okay, you weren't known for your grappling. <laughs> and Michael Bisbee <laughs> held on for that for the rest of the night. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember what fight it was. It might have been the Grasso fight where he brought it back up. <laughs> But Fitzgerald, uh, Fitzgerald during that whole thing was like, yeah, I got a white belt. Uh, I only got a white belt. And, like, B- Michael Bisping was like, okay, I'm going to remember that. And during the Grasso fight, like, <laughs> they were breaking something down. And Bisping just turns to Fitzgerald and is like, Brandon, you got a white belt. Explain to the audience what's going on right now. <laughs> it's, those, it's those little moments. <laughs> where like, I know some people don't like commentary, but it's those little moments of why I will always appreciate commentary, because those little moments are gems. You know, <laughs> you know, after that car was over, <laughs> in the post production room. Oh yeah, we're we're about to wrestle. He probably just shot a double on him in the back. That is <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> oh man. Shots to Brandon Fitzgerald. Did you did, him ducking for cover when they started throwing bottles was hilarious. Because like, and I didn't realize it until I saw the video. Because during during when it actually happened during the main event, you hear his commentary and it doesn't sound like he's doing anything, like when he's describing what's happening. But no, nah, he was under the desk like the entire time, and it's it's funny. But good lord. God love commentators, man. God love them. That was a uh, <laughs> that was UFC Mexico City. Um, it was an experience. Um, well, you know what? You know what? Let me be fair. If you remove the main event, which sucks that you have to say that because it's the main event, but if you remove the main event, uh, shenanigans. And you remove your fanhood from anybody you may have been attached to on this card. It was a good card. There were a lot of good fights. A lot of good, there, were, there were some good moments. It was a solid night of fights. But if you mix in your fanhood and then with maybe how you felt about any of these scorecards on certain fights, you might feel some kind of way. But strictly just off of fights, it was a, it was a really solid card. It just that main event kind of sucked the air out of a lot of what this card was. Like, they had a good thing going, and then the main event happened, and it was kind of like, uh, you know. 
you were waiting for the giant payoff and you never got the payoff. Right. But it was still a solid night of fights. I, I can't say it was wasn't worth watching. Like definitely go back and watch Grasso versus Esparza. Definitely watch Brandon Moreno and Askarov. Um, really, the, the whole main card was was really was was pretty good. I enjoyed the main card and the prelims had had good happenings too. Like the Nelson Polo Reyes KO. Um, if you want to watch Keonis just styling somebody for three rounds, you can watch that. Uh, Angela Hill fight was really dope. Uh, watch the Paul Craig finish, and like I said, Betch Cohey and Eubanks. It was a good card. It was a, it was a good card. It's just there were little little things here and there that just kind of derailed it, and then the ending was just like ah, like you just kind of threw your hands up and flipped the table. Like <laughs> can't believe y'all did this to me, but it was a good <laughs> night of fights. Good night of fights. Um, so that was UFC Mexico City. So if you have uh, ESPN Plus. Or any other alternative methods that you use, uh, I would encourage you to go back and watch the card. At least to watch the card for the fight that you were interested in. Chances are it was probably a good fight. Uh, so it's great. Shout out to uh, yeah, shout out to everybody at UFC Mexico City. But that's all we got uh, for today's uh, fight. So. Uh, what's going on next week on the 28th? We will have UFC Fight Night. I ain't naming the number. What city is it? Copenhagen. That? UFC Fight Night. Yeah, Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Denmark. Oh, it's Cop. No. Oh. No, no, it's is Copenhagen. It? Oh. <laughs> but UFC Copenhagen going down next week on the 28th. That is headlined by Jack Hermanson and Jared Cannonier. Also on the card, you got Gunnar Nelson versus Gilbert Burns, Lando Venata versus Mark Diacasey, Saya Bahasura versus Ismail Naradi, Brandon Davis versus Giga Chikadisi. How do we say that? <laughs> um, Mace Chiasone's on the card against Lena Landsberg. Ian Kudalaba's on the card against Khalil Roundtree. OSP against Michelle Olis. I can't say that last name. I'm going to get that wrong. Oh, my God. But... It's like a solid night. Like a pretty... There should be a couple of good moments on this card. I think it'll be cool. Uh, so that will be going down on the... 28th. 28th is... Uh, what Bellator got? Yes, that is uh, the yeah, uh, Patricio Pitbull Ooh. Juan Archuleta card. Ooh. The... To be honest, y'all... Bell uh, Bellator is a better card. Yeah, the Bellator card is definitely a better card. Man, uh... Yeah, also on the 28th. Patricio Pitbull versus Juan Archuleta. Gegard Musasi versus Machida. Darian Caldwell versus Her uh, Henry Corrales. Daniel Vitro versus Saul Rogers. AJ McKee versus jo uh, Georgie Caracanya. Leandro Higo versus Sean Bunch. <laughs> and Antonio McKee. Yes. And yeah, you heard that right. Antonio McKee. Papa McKee. Versus, yeah. Papa McKee versus William Sriapal. Um, you know, I, I can't say the next card because I vowed to never bring him up on this podcast again, but he's fighting. Uh, no, nah, this, this card's fire. This card is heat. Like, <laughs> yeah, if, if, to be honest, if you got it, if you can only watch one of these, I honestly would tell you to watch the Bellator one. Yeah. They also have their Ireland card on Friday, the, the day before, but I don't think anybody's excited about that one. Um... Hold up. Yeah, that's. I'll take a gander who's on. I mean, it does have Benson Henderson, Miles Jury, which is a fine fight. But... There's a couple. Uh, all right, you got Gallagher Salazar, MVP versus Richard Kelly. Kelly, how we say it? Uh, Ryan Scope versus Peter Quilly. I remember Ryan Scope. That might be decent. Yeah, Bendo versus Miles Jury, which I'll definitely watch. Outside of that... John Tuck, Brandon Gertz. Where's Gertz at? He's on? Uh, yes. All right, so yeah, if it's a Brandon Gertz fight, you got to watch that. Any any Brandon Gertz fight is, uh, is worth a watch. But that card, not as good as the other one. But, you know, it might be decent. It might be. If nothing, at least watch the main card. It'll, it'll, probably, it'll probably be okay, at least. Hey, um, we do got some, uh, some boxing, though. Uh, we we got Errol Spence Jr. fighting Sean Porter hey. on the 28th. Um, I think, is that the same card as Andre Durrell, David Benavides? I believe so. Um, so you got a pretty good back-to-back -back 
sure right there. I think it's on pay per view though, so you know if. Uh, I'm I'm sure there's a bunch of different ways to watch it. Yeah, I gotta gotta yeah, I gotta catch both of those though. Cause I'm definitely uh gotta catch uh El Spence and definitely gotta watch uh Santa Vita, So uh, what's next the... week's gonna be gonna be good, man. It's oh. gonna be a lot to it's gonna be a lot to talk about. Yeah, they got um Nicole Adams is fighting on Friday too. Um, she's coming back off an of injury. Uh, she was supposed to have her first world title shot um since time earlier this year, but she got hurt and she hasn't been seen since. Um, and heavyweight, uh, British heavyweight, um, sensation slash up and comer slash whatever, Daniel Dubois. Is he British? I want to say he is British. He's fighting in London, but he has a French name, which throws me off. Yeah, Daniel Dubois, or Du Bois, or however the hell you pronounce his name. Uh, he'll be fighting on Friday on that Nicole Adam, as the headliner on the Nicole Adams card. Against Ebenezer Tete, Tete, from Ghana, who is thirty-one but looks like he's forty-five, <laughs> in what's essentially a stay busy fight for uh, the boys. Um, yeah, so there's a bunch of stuff going on next week. Yeah, next week you can definitely get in where you fit in. I there's gonna be a, a think lot going a around. There's a gory card next week. Uh, am I mistaken? It's gory sixty-seven next week. Uh, let's see. Is that the, that's not the Miami one, is it? I want to say it is. Yes. Uh, Glory. My, uh, 68 Miami. Perea versus Abina. Will be next oh, yeah, yeah. Saturday. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah, so next, yeah, next week's going to be crazy. Yes. Yeah, next week's going to be fire. And I'm definitely, um, man, I don't know how I'm going to watch all this. <laughs> But I really wanted to see that uh, Pereira fight because he's going up for history trying to get two belts. So, um, yeah, if nothing else, I got to at least just catch that fight or try to. Yep. So, yeah, next week when we come in here, yeah, there'll, there'll probably be a lot. Uh, there'll be a lot to cover. But, uh, yeah, so next week should be fun. We'll do our yeah. best. Yeah, we'll do our best. Be ready for a four-hour podcast. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know who we haven't heard from in forever. And since the UFC uh, and I guess Bellator are going to Europe, we have. I, I think we should. I think we should call in our European fight card expert. Yeah, I was honestly just thinking about him this morning, looking through cards. I was like, which of these cards is obscure enough that Joey's gonna <laughs> hop on? And then I, I looked at the Singapore one. I was like. I thought Joey would do this one. But then I was like, it's, it, but I feel like the the card has to be obscure in fighters and location. Because I feel like he pops up on like cards for places that nobody would even think to go to. UFC Krakow. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, Singapore might not be, it might not be obscure enough, but... Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll probably have to fit Joey in here. One, one of these, uh, one of these cards will be obscure enough to get him on. So, Joey, if you're listening, uh, you're being recruited. <laughs> Find your obscure card of the month in October or or late uh, September and, and be ready. Um, but no, lots of dope fights coming up. So next week should be dope. But that's all we got for today's episode. So we can go ahead and close. With uh, parting shots and shout outs. Uh, so I don't have this in front of me, and I'm probably going to get this wrong. Actually, you will probably know about this more than I would, but um, I'm going to give <laughs> I got to give a Pokemon shout out. Um, I saw that Far Fetched evolved. Yes. He has a new form. Yes. Shout out to Far Fetched. He had a glow up. Uh,. I can't remember what his new form is called, but... Sir Fetchington. <laughs> yeah, yes. I actually have no... Wait, is that what he's called? Because I actually have no fucking idea. Hold on. But I think it is, sir. Or is that what people are calling him? It, now it's going to bug me. Uh, Sir Fetched. Yes. <laughs> Shout out to Sir Fetched. Hey, man. I knew you could. I knew you had it in you to get the glow up, homie. I knew you had it in you. I like how it starts Shout- just a giant onion. <laughs> Shout out to Surfit. 
Um, and my second shout out, um, you'll never hear me do this uh, very often. Uh, shouting out a billionaire. Mm. Um, yeah, that doesn't happen often. This might be the only time it happens. Uh, it sounds like you lost me here. I know, I know. But I have to applaud good deeds. Like one that actually seems, I'm going to step out on a limb that seems genuine. So I'm going to put myself out there. But gentlemen out there who I had never heard of until like last year. Um, uh, his name is Robert F. Smith. How all the billionaires have all like these super normal names? But Robert F. Smith, um, I don't know if he graduated from Morehouse. He did. Um, okay. All right. So he's paying off student debt. Um, but then it recently came out. I don't know if this was today or yesterday. Um, not only is he wiping the student uh, the debt from the students, but he is also going to pay off the debt uh for the loans that the parents had to take out which came out to the tune of 34 mil um and that covers over 400 graduates um and obviously he has the money dude is worth I think according to this article he's worth five billion dollars he runs some kind of uh what is this a venture capital firm called vista equity partners whatever that is um, but you know what, I saw this, and I was like, you know what, pretty much everybody I know who went to college is still in debt one way or another. Yep. Still, <laughs> still making those payments, and I think it's awesome that not only did you pay off the debt of the students who, like, leaving college with no debt is, like, boy, do you set yourself up in it, it, to be in, that's, that's a good spot to be in. To graduate, especially spend like four years at a a known college and leave with no debt, that's got to be a great feeling. Um, it shouldn't be set up that acts like this have to happen for kids to graduate with no debt, but that's a whole other discussion that we don't really got time to get into. But you know what? I'll give a shout out to Robert F. Smith. Congrats to, you know, not congrats, a shout out to paying off the debt for these kids who will now be set up for a much better future. And especially like, paying off the parents too who probably didn't really have the money to do this but you know you want your kid to succeed you want them to have the best chance to be set up for the future so you kind of just got to do what you got to do um so shout out to him for wiping some slates clean for some people who probably really really needed it and i'm pretty sure there'll be some stories from that class who probably will go on to do great things and a lot of it will be you know due to the fact that they were able to leave college with no debt. Um, so I'll give him a shout-out for that. I, I thought that was pretty dope. Probably never shout-out another billionaire again. <sighs> but, Please. <laughs> I, I'll give him that one. I'll give enough. him that one. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Um, hey, better than what Bezos is doing with his money, I guess. Yeah. Um, no, um, I have, like, Six shout-outs, because I couldn't limit it down, because there's a lot going on this week. Um, first off, shouts to Gangstar. I, hey. well, I guess DJ Premier, rest in peace, Guru. Um, they dropped a new song for the first time in, like, 17 years. And, like, eight years after Guru died. Um, it's been eight years. When did Guru die again? Was it 2013? Yeah, it's been some time. Yeah. But um, it's really it's, a, it's actually a really good song. And apparently, it's gonna be a new album. Uh, Family of Loyalty. Go listen to it. It's featuring J Cole. Uh, uh, yeah, I was I was actually kind of surprised. I went on like the um, the Gangstar Spotify page and like they have like full clip has like fifty five million listens. Hmm. And I for whatever reason I just wasn't expecting that. No, people love Gangstar. I know, but like. Hip hop acts don't have legs like rock acts do from the same era. You know what I mean? All right. Like Blink One Eighty Two is going to be storing uh, touring stadiums for the rest of their lives. Well, I don't know. Um, Big Daddy Kane is probably going to be stuck on reunion tours doing like one thousand fifteen hundred seat arena, uh, fifteen hundred street venues 
Oh no, no they still a lot of those legendary acts still do good. They do great overseas, not uh, so much in the states, because overseas kind of appreciates it a lot more than we do. Okay, that's good to know. We're we're, we're, we're spoiled. <laughs> but like, I'm ha- I'm happy like they're still getting listens and people still care about them, and the songs are probably doing pretty well. So like I, I'm I'm hopeful for this album. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip the next one. Uh, Shouts to uh, I don't have a Nintendo Switch, but I want one strictly to play Untitled Goose Game. Oh, I'm going to play that either tonight or tomorrow. Because <laughs> you're telling me I can play a very annoying bird that just <laughs> honks at people. That's all I want in my life. Oh man, I bought that ASAP yesterday. The second I woke up. <laughs> oh, man. Um, But that's all I want in my life, man. I, I just want to be, like, I, I, I love a good video game where you don't have to shoot somebody or fight somebody. And it's just like, you could just be super fucking annoying and just piss everybody off. And they can't <laughs> do a shit about it. It's great. Um, also, uh, WNBA news and shout outs. Shout outs to, um, well, I guess the four teams in the semifinals, but shout outs to the Mystics and the Connecticut Sun uh, specifically because it looks like they're going to go on to the finals. They're both up 2 0 in the semis. Um, if they do, I'm going to try and make it out to a Connecticut Sun game uh, in, uh, because they're only like two and a half, three hours away. So, shout outs to that. Shouts to my Liberty for getting the number one draft pick uh, for next year. We're taking Sabrina Ionescu. Uh, Ionescu um, triple double machine. That's like the record for most in college history or something like that, men's or women. So excited about that. Um, Shouts to my new favorite Twitter account, uh, Communist Bops, which is nothing but Soviet soldiers dancing. <laughs> to modern hits. Uh, I'm trying to decide which one's my favorite so far. Uh, I think it was the one that with them dancing to Mr. Brightside. Because, good God, that was great. Um, go follow them, or at least check them out. It's funny as shit. Um, and last and most somberly, I guess. The UA, uh, the UAW and Kaiser hospital workers are on strike currently. Um, I believe a UAW member uh, was arrested by the police last night for striking. Um, yep, solidarity with all workers. Also, speak of strikes, shout outs to all the kids who, str- uh, who were on strike during the climate strike on this previous, I think it was Monday. Um, the kids are all right, Mike. Sensei, sorry. Save the children. The, the, the children are all right. Shouts to those goth kids who are like, we want to die, but the earth doesn't. <laughs> that was their sign, and I respect that. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so I think that's all I got. Oh, actually, you know, shouts to, um, what's the dude's name? Demi Ade... Uh, Juyimbe, Juyimbe, ah, trash with names. Sorry, guys. Um, who has consistently over the past few years put out a YouTube video with him dancing to uh, September by Earth, Wind, and Fire, and uh, every year it gets more and more elaborate and brilliant and fantastic. And the one he put out for this year featured a mariachi band. And him editing editing himself into the music video for the song, <laughs> and it was a pure joy to watch. Go check that out. Um, it's on YouTube. So that's uh, all I got. Hey, Lance, I cool with the the epic shout out list. Uh, uh, and I always feel like I come on here and it's last minute, so I actually took the time to write these down. <laughs> yeah. I never think about it until like a minute before we start recording. I'm like, who do I want to try to give props to? Oh, man. 
Shout out to the Mariachi band. I appreciate y'all. Y'all out here doing God's work. Always. Always. Y'all were great when I went to New York. <laughs> but uh yeah man that's all we got for today's episode as always give us a listen on soundcloud youtube apple podcast spotify google play send questions to dojo talk podcast at yahoo.com hit us up on social media at the dojo talk podcast facebook page as well as the instagram page follow me on twitter and twitch at serial sensei where i will be playing that goose simulator game probably within the next day or two and if you want to support me, buy my book, The Arbar Chronicles, 99 cents on Amazon uh, for digital copy, eight ninety nine for a physical. And that is all we got for today's episode. So as always, anytime people are being punched and or kicked in the face, we will be there to talk about it. And until next time, we will catch you guys later. <laughs>